Hockey O'Clock mit Martin Pfanner wird präsentiert von Bet at Home, dem offiziellen Ligasponsor der Eishockey League. Hol dir jetzt deinen Eishockey Quotenboost auf Bet at Home. Unsere Liga, dein Spiel. Achtung! Was für ein Move! Nächste Chance! Was für ein Pass zur Mitte! 1-0! Und der nächste Fight am Eis entbrennt! Hier entladen sich die Emotionen! Da haben wir doch doch was, um mit der Zunge zu schnalzen! Folge 20 von Hockey O'Clock mit Martin Pfanner wagt mit Österreichs u 20 Assistant coach Phil Lukas einen ersten Ausblick auf das wichtigste Nachwuchsturnier des Planeten. Rob Daum analysiert wenige Tage vor seinem VSV-Engagement das Spiel der Blackwings und Greg Holz spricht über die jüngsten Wechsel am Coaching-Sektor. Das und noch viel mehr jetzt bei Hockey Clock mit Martin Pfanner macht natürlich auch immer wieder das österreichische Nationalteam zum Thema. Die IIHF hat der BWM leider Gottes für das A-Nationalteam einen Regel vorgeschoben. Das Highlight bleibt dementsprechend die anstehende U20 WM. Grund genug, auch äh, dem Coaching-Staff ein wenig Bedeutung beizumessen. Nicht nur ein wenig, sondern sehr viel. Und äh, Assistant Coach des U20-Nationalteams mit Phil Lukas sitzt mir jetzt gegenüber. Fehl alles Corona-konform. Erst einmal nur, dass wir das auch für die Öffentlichkeit festhalten. Und schön, dass du dir die Zeit nimmst, um Junior Hockey zu plaudern. Ja, ich freue mich auf meiner Seite. Ich freue mich, dass ich dich einmal im Podcast in Action sehen kann. Und natürlich freue ich mich, umso mehr zu Gast sein zu dürfen. Phil, wir rollen die, die, die Uhr oder die drehen die Uhr ein wenig zurück und gehen zur, zur Qualifikation, zur erfolgreichen beim Turnier in, in Weißrussland. Wie lange hat es bei dir gedauert, um, um das, was dort passiert ist, nämlich wirklich monumental historisches, wenn man, wenn man auch die letzten zwei Jahrzehnte betrachtet, einzuordnen, auch wirklich sacken zu lassen? Ja, das war, äh, das war schon ein unglaubliches, äh, ein unglaublicher Event, glaube ich, für alle, nicht nur für die Spieler, aber für uns Coaches auch. Und äh, wenn ich jetzt so zurückblicke, ich kann mich noch erinnern, wie ich dann nach dem letzten Spiel gegen Slowenien vor der Mannschaft gestanden bin und das habe ich wirklich so gemeint, wenn ich das gesagt habe, ja, das war wirklich der Highlight meines Jahres. Ja. Und wer hätte es das geglaubt, dass so, so, lang nach mein, also so kurz nach meiner Karriere, nach meinem Karriereende, dass ich sowas, so einen Highlight nochmal erleben kann und so bald vor allem äh, wieder erleben kann und das... Äh, ja, da war ich sehr stolz auf die Jungs und das hat schon eine Zeit lang gedauert. Wir sind dann am Abend noch auf ein Bier gegangen, natürlich alle zusammen, oder vielleicht ein zweites oder ein drittes. Und schlussendlich waren wir dann extrem erschöpft von dem ganzen Aufwand. Und äh, ja, das war, das, war, das war ähnlich zu vergleichen wie mit einem Meistertitel. Also man ist dann irgendwo müde, man kann es auch nicht fassen und irgendwann möchte man das Ganze genießen, aber man weiß nicht, wie man an die Sache rangeht. Und, äh, aber es war ein Riesenhochgefühl und... Äh, hat sicher eine Zeit lang gedauert, bis man das dann äh, verarbeitet hat und äh, war gefüllt mit Stolz, vor allem, äh, was die Jungs dort geleistet haben. Es fühlt sich noch viel länger an, als es ohnehin zurücklegt. Das war tatsächlich noch zu einer, zu einer ganz anderen Zeit, als, als das Coronavirus so noch, noch kein, kein allzu großes Thema war. Wie ist man dann aus, aus Weißrussland zurückgekehrt? Was waren so auf von dir, vom Coaching-Staff, die, 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 ersten, die ersten Schritte auf, auf dieser Road to, to Edmonton? Ja, zuerst einmal ein paar Nachrichten schreiben an die Jungs, die, mit denen ich selber zusammengespielt habe, die eigentlich in Nordamerika äh, leben, arbeiten und so weiter. Ich habe gesagt, hey, komm in der Edmonton so auf die Ort. Und äh, das war irgendwo das Erste. Und dann, ich glaube, äh, man, man hat es eigentlich dann, wie gesagt, man hat das einmal versucht zu so verarbeiten, was man da jetzt gerade erreicht hat und hat sich gefreut, wow, wir spielen jetzt dann wirklich eine, in einem Jahr, spielen wir gegen die Besten auf der Welt in diesem Alter. Und äh, ja, die Jungs können sie dort zeigen und sie können sich vergleichen, können schauen, wo die dort wirklich dann stehen und sie können sich dort messen. Ähm, aber die wirklichen Vorbereitungen, sage ich einmal, auch aufgrund von Covid-19, wo man nicht gewusst hat, findet das äh, Turnier überhaupt statt, die haben erst... Äh, relativ äh, spät, sage ich mal, stattgefunden. Hockey Canada hat sich dann äh, bereit erklärt, dass trotz allem, sage ich mal, das ja doch das einzige internationale Turnier überhaupt ist, das jetzt wirklich stattfindet. Und, und wir freuen uns natürlich äh, auf das. 
auch wenn der Event wahrscheinlich ein ganz anderer sein wird, weil wir in einer Bubble sein werden, weil es keine Zuschauer geben wird und wir sind ja im Mutterland des Eishockeys. Also dort wäre natürlich dann wahrscheinlich der Bär los, wenn alles unter normalen Umständen abläufen würde, aber dem wird nicht so sein. Und trotzdem wird es äh, eine unglaubliche Erfahrung für uns Coaches, für, für alle, die dabei sind und natürlich für die Spieler am meisten. Es war einer der, 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 der vielen Wegbereiter dieses, dieses grandiosen Erfolgs. Natürlich auch äh, VSV-Torhüter äh, Ali Schmidt, der, der öfter als nicht dem Gegner den, den Nerv gezogen hat. Und mit Ende des Turniers war es trotzdem klar, dass er zum Beispiel einer derjenigen sein wird, der dann, der dann das zu hohe Alter hat, um zur U20-WM zu fahren. Wie, wie bitter, und er ist ja nicht der Einzige, dem, dem, das, dem das so geht, wie, wie, wie bitter, beziehungsweise wie viel... Wie viel wie, wie, wie hat dich das empathisch berührt, wenn du weißt, da hilft einer unter, unter Aufopferung aller Dinge mit, diesen Erfolg zu schaffen und ist dann nicht mit dabei, um, um ihn auch zu genießen? Das ist eine gute Frage, weil ich, ich habe das selber nie so miterleben dürfen. Ich habe auf diesem Level dann eigentlich nie so die Erfolge feiern äh, können in dieser Altersgruppe. Äh, aber um auf Ali Schmidt einzugehen, was er auch wirklich geleistet hat, das muss man sich wirklich einmal vor Augen halten. Das ist ein es war unser Nummer 1 Torhüter, der fast keine Spiele bekommen hat in diesem Jahr bis dahin, bis zu dem Zeitpunkt. Und unter der Leitung natürlich von Jürgen Benker auch und unter der Mithilfe von ihm hat er die Dinge angefasst wie ein absoluter, äh, wie ein absoluter Pro. Und das muss man mal äh, wirklich so erwähnen, wie es wirklich war. Der, der war in einer Zone drin, und das ist ja ein, ein Riesen, eine Riesenbelastung, nicht nur körperlich, äh, sage ich mal, fünf in sieben zu spielen, aber auch vor allem mental. Und der war da drinnen und den hat nichts berührt. Da ist einmal was schief gegangen und der war wirklich der Riesenrückhalt. Also ich traue mich behaupten, ohne Ali Schmidt hätten wir diesen Aufstieg einfach nicht geschafft. Ja. Und was er dort für Leistung vollbracht hat, ohne Spielpraxis in diesem Jahr, muss man fast so sagen, weil in Zell am See hat er fast keine Spiele bekommen, in, in, in Villach auch nicht. Und dann kommt er und reißt uns eigentlich äh, da zum Aufstieg mit. Ich habe mich irrsinnig gefreut für ihn. Ja. Und äh, natürlich, bei den World Juniors ist es einfach so, äh, dann fällt man aus dem Jahrgang raus und am nächsten Jahr ist er nicht dabei. Und äh, natürlich ist man da irgendwo traurig, aber ich glaube, für ihn ist es immer mehr so ein Highlight. Ich war dabei und ich habe da eine Riesenrolle in dem, äh, in, in dem Jahr gespielt, dass wir das überhaupt diesen Aufstieg geschafft haben. Und äh, äh, man spricht immer davon, dass das historisch ist, dass man aufgestiegen ist und so. Ja, das passiert nicht alle Jahre. Das kann man schon so sagen. Äh, ich bin mir sicher, dass das in Zukunft irgendwann einmal wieder passieren wird. Äh, also lassen wir mal die Kirche im Dorf, aber es war schon ein Riesen-Achievement. Ja. Einer, der auch nicht mit dabei ist und, und sicherlich auch äh, großen Anteil an, an diesem Erfolg hat, ist Marco Pewell, hat vom, vom VSV ähm, keine Freigabe bekommen, weil man in der aktuellen Situation offenbar nicht auf ihn verzichten kann und, und will. Wie hast du die, die, die Nachricht wahrgenommen? Also sie ist Marco Pewell, wird nicht nach Kanada gehen dürfen? Ja, natürlich, äh, ich sage immer, äh, Emotionen sind ein schlechter Ratgeber. Meine erste Emotion war natürlich schon ein bisschen Unverständnis, muss ich äh, klar so sagen. Äh, und natürlich äh, versucht man dann ein bisschen sage ich mal, Zeit äh, vergehen zu lassen und sich in die Lage des VSV zu versetzen. Aber ähm, natürlich finde ich es bitter für ihn. Wir haben jetzt als Coaching-Staff äh, zwei Jahre lang zusammenarbeiten können. Äh, ich glaube, wir haben sehr gut zusammengearbeitet, äh, Marco Bewell, Fipo Pinter, I und, äh, und Jürgen Benker. Und das war eigentlich schon sehr eingespielt, natürlich äh, so kurz vor diesem großen Event jetzt erfahren zu müssen in seiner Situation, dass äh, wo wir lassen die nicht gehen. Äh, man muss auch immer vorsichtig sein, wie das wirklich abgelaufen ist. Das kann ich jetzt nicht beurteilen, aber äh, finde ich schon bitter, weil man eben, wer weiß, wann das wieder passiert oder wann dieses... Äh, Wann, wann so ein Event für Österreichs Eishockey wieder zustande kommt. In einem Jahr. Ja, in einem Jahr, das, das stimmt. Wer weiß, ob er da dabei ist. Ja. Aber wie gesagt, ich finde es bitter für ihn, ich finde es schade für ihn und ich äh, finde es auch schade für uns, dass äh, wir da jetzt das Team äh, den Aufstieg so geschafft haben, als Coaching-Staff und äh, so auch nicht weiterarbeiten können unter diesen Umständen. Aber ja, it is what it is, sage ich. Und äh, tut mir leid für ihn vor allem. Und ähm, ja, mehr kann ich dazu eigentlich nicht sagen. 
Jetzt übernimmt Roger Bader anstatt seiner die, die Head-Coaching-Aufgaben. Wie ist für all diejenigen, die, die den, den Coaching-Staff des U20-Nationalteams nicht kennen, noch nicht kannten, die Aufgabenverteilung? Head-Coach Roger Bader, klar. Und Goalie-Trainer äh, Jürgen Penker, klar. Es gibt mit dir und Philipp Pinter die Assistance. Wie teilt ihr euch das auf? Ist das vielleicht schon in Kategorien eingeteilt oder, oder gibt es äh, diesbezüglich dann in St. Pölten noch Findungsphasen? Also ich habe ich hab Erfahrung, äh, ich hab mit Roger Bader zu arbeiten. Ich habe die Möglichkeit schon ein paar Mal bekommen. Ähm, bin sehr happy darüber, äh, dass ich die Erfahrungen schon auch machen habe dürfen. Ähm, das heißt, äh, wir haben erst kürzlich über diese Dinge gesprochen, ähm, wie die Verteilung auch sein soll. Ähm, es soll sich eigentlich nicht zu viel verändern aus der Vergangenheit. Ähm, wir sind beide Assistant Coaches und wir, also Philipp Pinter und ich. Äh, Roger Bader wird äh, Head Coach sein und wird die Entscheidungen auch treffen, dass schlussendlich, was auch seine, seine Aufgabe ist, wird auch Großteil, sage ich mal, der Trainings leiten. Ähm, wir werden mehr, sage ich mal, für die Kommunikation mit den Spielern äh, zuständig sein. Äh, das, sage ich mal, weiterzugeben an die Spieler, äh, was. Äh, was, was verlangt wird oder was, was umzusetzen ist und auch immer wieder Feedback zu geben, das ist ihm ganz, ganz wichtig. Und äh, auf der Bank wird es so sein, dass äh, der Philipp Pinter weiterhin, sage ich einmal, äh, die, die Verteidiger macht äh, und coacht. Und äh, ich wäre eigentlich den Part, äh, wie es Markus Beintner im, im A-Nationalteam macht, äh, sage ich mal, das Spiel zu beobachten und eigentlich den, 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 den Spielern persönlich sagen wir, Feedback über die Dinge geben, äh, beziehungsweise Systemsachen äh, korrigieren. Ähm, aber sicher geht es mehr darum, sage ich mal, äh, Feedback zu geben und ich bin mehr dafür da, dass ich mich aufs Spiel konzentriere und äh, den Spielern eventuell Anweisungen gebe. Jetzt zeichnen wir das Gespräch am Samstag auf, das dann am Dienstag auch erscheinen wird. Das ist der letzte Tag, bevor es für, für dich in St. Pölten in die erste Bubble geht. Wie ist die, die Roadmap jetzt in Richtung Edmonton für dich persönlich? Die Roadmap ist jetzt, wir treffen uns Sonntag einmal in, in, in St. Pölten. Es ist doch ein erweiterter Kader. Man wird dort ein Hauptaugenmerk, sage ich mal, auf das legen, dass man, dass man trainiert, dass man die Jungs auch noch physisch belastet. Ja, man kommt ja doch von äh, zwei freien Tagen, äh, dann rückt man mal ein. Ähm, es ist ja doch alles ganz anders als normal. Normalerweise also frühstückt man gemeinsam. Normal sitzt, äh, ist, ist alles, sage ich mal, viel offener. Aber hier kommt Frühstück aufs Zimmer und solche Sachen. Also das, äh, es wird einfach von dem Aspekt, sage ich mal, eine ganz andere Challenge werden. Ja. Aber es wird äh, teilweise gemeinsam trainiert, weil es doch ein sehr großer Kader ist, äh, der dann noch ein bisschen ausgedünnt wird am Ende der Woche. Ähm, äh, es wird aber auch teilweise, sage ich mal, in zwei Gruppen trainiert. Ja. Es wird auch off äh, trainiert äh, und zwei Eisheiten pro Tag. Das heißt, die Jungs werden schon relativ drankommen. Ja. Äh, auch aus dem Grund, dass in dieser Woche wirklich trainiert wird. Es wird auch, ge äh, es wird auch äh, gewisse Eiszeiten geben, wo nur Scrimmage gemacht wird, äh, wo wir natürlich die Jungs in Spielsituationen sehen werden, auch wenn es nur ein Trainingsspiel ist, aber das ist unsere beste Möglichkeit, ähm, sagen wir mal, die Jungs in Situationen zu sehen, wo wirklich, wo sie äh, Spielsituationen, auf Spielsituationen reagieren müssen, weil schlussendlich haben wir nur zwei Testspiele dann drüben in Edmonton äh, und dann geht es turnierlos. Ja. Also, ähm, also man wird die Jungs da dann mal äh, definitiv belasten, ähm, um, um sie, sage ich mal, auch physisch, sage ich mal, auf ein Label vorzubereiten, dass sie dann äh, äh, antreffen werden. Ähm, auch wenn wir das vielleicht nicht ganz treffen werden können, versuchen wir unser Bestes dort, äh, vor allem auf Tempo und äh, auch gewisse taktische Sachen und auch auf die Füße, sage ich mal, zu setzen, dass wir die Jungs dort bestmöglich vorbereiten. Was sind für dich als, als, als Coach Benchmarks, Punkte, die du, die du umsetzen möchtest, die du auch von der Mannschaft dann umgesehen, äh, umgesetzt sehen möchtest? Benchmarks, ja. Äh ja, da, nicht nur, weil ich zwei Jahre jetzt in dem Feld tätig war, aber ich mein, selber als Spieler hat sich sehr viel um das darum gedreht, wie gut meine körperliche Verfassung war. Ja. Das ist für mich einmal eine Grundbasis und wenn man, so, wenn man sich so umsieht, ich bin ja sehr interessiert an der ganzen Sportwelt, nicht nur Eishockey, aber wenn man sieht, wer alle erfolgreich ist, ich glaube, keiner ist jemals äh, mit einer goldenen Heimgang und hat gesagt, weißt du was, ich war körperlich so schlecht beieinander, aber, aber taktisch war ich unglaublich. 
ähm, also die Grundbasis für jeden individuellen Athleten bzw. für jede Mannschaft, die erfolgreich ist. Und da kann man, glaube ich, das wäre interessant, einmal sag ich mal, in der Geschichte nachzuschauen, die waren alle topfit. Und das ist einmal ein Grundelement, eine Grundbasis sag ich mal, für das, dass man überhaupt erfolgreich sein kann. Ja, also ich, ich, bin, ich bin schon ein Fan von Struktur und von Taktik und das gehört definitiv zum Eishockey dazu. Meiner Meinung nach wird das oftmals doch sehr, sehr viel übertrieben. Äh, nicht in dem Sinn, dass es nicht dazugehört, sondern einfach sehr viel Zeit drauf geht und eigentlich die Physis liegen bleibt. Ja. Und äh, das ist etwas, äh, das meines Erachtens nicht passieren sollte im Eishockeysport. Es ist äh, körperlich, mental ein sehr anspruchsvolles Spiel und dementsprechend gehört auch trainiert. Und das, ist meine, das ist meine Meinung. Ähm, sonst äh, Benchmarks, ich meine, man könnte mal stundenlang reden über das, was für mich jetzt im Eishockey wichtig ist. Äh, äh, man muss natürlich schon beurteilen, was hat man zur Verfügung, ja? was, was hat man am Personal. Ähm, wie, wie, möchte man, wie möchte man sein Spiel anlegen und dementsprechend äh, hat man jetzt äh, 20 Zauberer draußen, dann muss man das Ganze natürlich äh, anders äh, spielerisch angehen, als, als, als wenn man lauter Arbeit da draußen hat. Ja. Also da muss man, das muss man beurteilen und dann natürlich adaptieren. Mach dann einen Vorschlag, bevor wir stundenlang auch über Benchmarks reden und was Coach Phil Lukas gerne umgesetzt sehen würde. Lass mir doch einen deiner Weggefährten zu Wort kommen. Ich habe äh, einen Mann aus dem Coaching-Staff des U20-Nationalteams gebeten, ein klein wenig äh, über Phil Lukas, den Coach, zu erzählen. Jürgen Penker. Philipp Lukas, Trainerqualitäten. Naja, ich glaube, dass der Phil sehr, sehr viele Qualitäten als Trainer hat. Äh, ich glaube, dass er taktisch äh, und systemtechnisch einfach extrem gutes Auge hat für Spiel, er kann Spieler sehr, sehr gut lesen, für welche Bereiche sie eingesetzt werden können. Ich glaube, überhaupt einfach ein super Auge für, für, fürs Eis. Ähm, durch, glaube ich, seine Ausbildung und seine Weiterentwicklung auch neben der Trainerausbildung, ähm, einfach Trainingssteuerung und körperlich, was man braucht, ähm, Einfach wahrscheinlich einer der best ausgebildetsten in ganz Österreich. Ähm, und auch sozial. Einfach jemand, wo, glaube ich, selber viel mitgemacht hat im Hockey und dadurch auch für Spieler ein Ohr hat, dass er zuhorcht, auch wenn es mal nicht so rennt. Also ich glaube, sozial sehr gut ausgebildet, taktisch sehr gut ausgebildet. Und äh, on ice wie auch off ice einfach, ich glaube, ein sehr, sehr gutes Gesamtpaket. Das Gesamtpaket, das, das Österreich dann oder das, das Teil hoffentlich auch österreichischer Erfolge sein wird. Spielerisch, athletisch, taktisch oder alles erwähnt, aber wie wichtig ist es tatsächlich, dieses, dieses Zuhören, auch, auch auf Trainerbasis? Ist das möglicherweise die unterschätzteste aller, aller Komponenten? Ja, du nimmst mir die Worte aus dem Mund. Also es ist. Ohne dem meines Erachtens geht gar nichts mehr. Ja, also man kann die besten Spieler haben, wenn man sie nicht dort irgendwo abholt, wo sie abgeholt werden müssen. Und das ist für jeden anders. Ja, das, ist, das ist wirklich für jeden anders. Den einen kann man ein bisschen mehr auf die Zeichen steigen. Ähm, aus dem anderen, äh, sage ich mal, den anderen müssen wir vielleicht ein bisschen mehr aufbauen. Ich habe letztens den Podcast gehört mit Mike Stewart und der hat es eigentlich perfekt nicht äh, sagen können. Es ist wirklich, man, man kann nicht alle gleich behandeln. Uh, man kann nicht auf alle gleich zugehen. Ja? Und uh, uh, da, ich, da ist, glaube ich, da liegt die Riesenkunst, sage ich mal, im Coaching. Um, und das wollte ich auch ein bisschen sagen. Wenn man, wenn man ständig stundenlang Videos analysiert und schaut, wie man nicht eventuell seine Struktur im Spiel verbessern kann, aber komplett die Menschlichkeit, sage ich mal, verabsäumt, ja, dann, dann haut einem die Mannschaft ab und man merkt es nicht einmal. Also das habe ich oft genug miterleben müssen, auch als aktiver Spieler. Ich glaube, der Jürgen hat es angesprochen, der hat äh, viele meiner Phasen auch als aktiver Spieler noch mitmachen oder miterleben können, wie es mir oftmals auch gegangen ist, emotional. Und äh, das war nicht immer einfach. Und äh, ja, vielleicht hätte ich mir auch gern gewünscht, sage ich mal, dass mir irgendwer abholt oder dass mir irgendwer Feedback gibt. Und ich glaube, Feedback ist das Aller, Allerwichtigste für die Athleten. Im, im, im Sport, ob junger oder, oder ältere Spieler, das ist alles egal, weil im Prinzip wollen wir als Spieler, ich sage jetzt wir noch, wir wollen alle nur 
gesehen werden. Wir wollen Anerkennung. Äh, die einen im anderen Ausmaß als die anderen, aber wir wollen ein Zugehörigkeitsgefühl haben. Ähm, und da spielt der Coach eine Riesenrolle. Das, das vermitteln zu können, es ist um und auf. Äh, und da kann einer, und nur wenn das gegeben ist, dann kann einer auch seine Topleistung abrufen. Und das ist das Spannende am Coaching. Das ist, das ist wahrscheinlich das Spannendste überhaupt. Weil es stimmt schon was, es ist äh, not what you know, es ist, wie du das umbringst. Ja. Wir drücken am Sonntag insgesamt 36 Spieler ins, ins Camp in St. Pölten ein. Es sind sechs Torhüter, zwölf Verteidiger, 18 Stürmer. Somit 30 Feldspieler, die auf 22 runtergekürzt werden. Bei den Goalies wird der Cut von 6 auf, auf 3 sein. Bevor wir dann, dann vielleicht auch zu diesem Cut-Prozedere kommen, äh, ein paar Highlights im, im Einberufungskader sind natürlich die Recent Draftees, wenn man so will, mit äh, Timo Nickel und mit, äh, mit Marco Rossi. Ähm, auf der, der Goalie-Position ist man relativ breit aufgestellt, auch mit Leuten, die schon in der heimischen Bette Tom Eiser gelegen mit Sebastian Raneschitz eine Talentprobe abgeben durften. Und ich weiß, Coaches hassen Name-Dropping. Ähm, nichtsdestotrotz würde mich interessieren, auf wen du dich besonders freust. Ist es, ist es an, an Marco Rossi, weil er, weil er spielerisch wahrscheinlich die Speerspitze des, des, des Teams sein wird, oder ist es jemand ganz anderer? Ja, brauchen wir nicht um den heißen Brei reden. Ich glaube, Marco Rossi ist sich dessen auch bewusst, genauso wie wir uns dessen bewusst sind, dass er eine Riesenrolle spielen wird, dass er natürlich ein Leistungsträger für uns sein will, aber äh, nicht nur will, aber dass er sein wird. Mich persönlich freut es natürlich, weil ich habe ihn so eigentlich noch nie gesehen. Ja, und natürlich freue ich mich, dass ich äh, als, als ein, ein hoher Draft-Pick hin oder her, ich muss ich ehrlich sagen, ich sage nicht, dass mir das wurscht ist, es freut mich für ihn, aber mich, ich freue mich eigentlich, den Menschen Marco Rossi kennenlernen zu können, die Möglichkeit zu haben. Ich freue mich auch, seine Fähigkeiten einmal zu Gesicht zu bekommen. Und dann freue ich mich natürlich auch, sage ich mal, ihn da eventuell begleiten zu können für diese nächsten drei, vier Wochen. Aber ich bin voll bei dir. Also mein Fokus, mein Hauptfokus liegt nicht auf, auf, auf Marco Rossi oder Timo Nickel. Ich freue mich, dass, dass wir die Jungs an Bord haben, dass wir tolle Spieler da an Bord haben. Aber es geht wieder darum, sage ich mal, aus, aus jetzt einmal 30 runter zu cutten auf 24 plus 3, mit denen man dann nach Edmonton geht und schlussendlich eine, ein, ein, ein Kollektiv zu formen, das super zusammenpasst. Und da muss man echt sagen, das hat Marco Bewal wirklich natürlich auch vielleicht unter unseren unter unserem Feedback sehr, sehr gut gemacht in den letzten zwei Jahren und deswegen waren wir auch unter Anführungszeichen erfolgreich, ähm, da, weil er da ein sehr gutes Gefühl gehabt hat und ein sehr gutes äh, Auge auch für das, welcher Spieler wo eventuell eingesetzt werden sollte und wo, wo braucht man was anderes und äh, da hat er sehr, sehr gute Entscheidungen getroffen. Ähm, das, äh, da muss ich ihm wirklich ein Lob aussprechen und ich hoffe natürlich, dass uns das heuer auch wieder so gelingt, dass wir wirklich äh, nicht mit den besten Einzelspielern, aber mit dem besten Kollektiv äh, an, die, an dieses Turnier gehen. Wenn nur so haben wir irgendwie auch nur eine Chance, sage ich mal, dass wir dort äh, äh, unsere Ziele erreichen. Jetzt ist Team Canada seit 16. November im Camp und den nehme ich mal außen vor, weil Eishockey dort einen völlig anderen Stellenwert hat und, und wenn, wenn sie fünf Monate im Camp sein müssten, um das Spiel zu gewinnen, oder um das Turnier zu gewinnen, würden sie es wahrscheinlich machen. Russland seit dem 28. November. Die Slowakei seit dem 30. Tschechien beginnt heute das Camp, Österreich und alle anderen Nationen erst morgen. Ist das das absolute Maximum oder wäre von Verbandsseite der Wunsch gewesen, mehr Vorbereitungszeit zu bekommen? Um Soweit ich das beurteilen kann, glaube ich, ist das das Maximum, so war das vorgesehen. Und äh, um, um uns jetzt generell zu, ver zu vergleichen mit so großen Eishockey-Nationen, wie, wie sie du jetzt genannt hast, das, ich glaube, das wäre einfach, ja, das wäre vielleicht ein Riesenwunsch, aber das wäre vielleicht nicht ganz korrekt. Äh, wir sind froh über die Vorbereitungszeit, die wir bekommen. Äh, unter dem Aspekt natürlich, dass wir heuer diese Mannschaft noch nicht einmal benannt gehabt haben. Normalerweise haben wir im November ein Turnier, wo wir zumindest einmal äh, Spieler sehen. Normalerweise haben wir sogar äh, ein erstes, äh, einen ersten Zusammenzug im August schon, äh, der in den vergangenen Jahren, sage ich mal, 
in Zell am See immer stattgefunden hat. Also es ist wirklich so, man hat die Jungs einfach noch nicht gesehen. Man hat jetzt, glaube ich, im November in, in St. Pölten äh, zwei Spiele gehabt gegen, gegen, äh, gegen Ungarn. Somit hat man sich ein bisschen ein Bild machen können, hat einmal die Mannschaft zusammenführen können. Äh, somit hat man ein bisschen eine Idee von dem Ganzen. Ähm, aber natürlich, äh, es werden jetzt, wird jetzt eine intensive Zeit, äh, nicht nur für die Spieler, aber auch für uns Coaches, Entscheidungen zu treffen, äh, die Jungs äh, bestmöglich zu coachen. Und über das Coaching haben wir eben schon geredet, nicht nur, sage ich mal, die Dinge zu tun, die es braucht am Eis, sondern auch vom Eis weg. Man muss mit den Jungs reden, man muss ein Gespür kriegen für die Jungs. Es wird auch sicher keine, es wird eine außergewöhnliche Aufgabe. Schlussendlich sind wir in einer Bubble, die wird auch für mich neu und für alle Coaches neu. Wir werden sehr viel Zeit alleine verbringen. Das darf man nicht außer Acht lassen, wie man diese Zeit auch gestaltet. Und da werden wir versuchen, sage ich mal, da mit einem guten Konzept oder werden wir versuchen, die Jungs auch da vom Eis, sage ich mal, nicht ständig zu belästigen, aber halbwegs zu coachen, dass, dass man da einiges vielleicht weitergeben kann. Videospiele und TV-Serien als, als großer ja. Tipp. Quatschen wir dann nachher noch drüber. Ja, was, und Chips was, ohne Ende oder was? <lacht> wie du, so Zeit, wir das nicht wie du in Zeit rüberbringen kannst. Ähm, was, bevor wir dann, dann spezifisch über das Turnier sprechen, immer wieder erwähnt wird, ist das Level of Play der U20-Weltmeisterschaft. Das sagen sehr, sehr viele ähm, Insider und, und, und Experten, dass das das bessere Turnier wäre als die IIHF AWM. Wie siehst du das? Ja, schwer zu beurteilen, weil ich noch nie dort war. Ich war zwar bei Erwachsenen-WMs, äh, AWMs, und da war das Level of Play, wenn man so sagen darf, ja, es war, es war immer ein, ein Eye-Opener, sagen wir es einmal so, weil ich habe wirklich sehr viel Aufwand betrieben in Sachen Training und, und Vorbereitung in, in meiner aktiven Karriere und dann kommt man auf eine AWM und auf einmal denkt man sich, wow, das ist wie eine andere Sportart. Ja? Und das ist wirklich so, das, ist das, das Level of Play ist einfach ein ganz anderes, als wir es einfach gewohnt sind, in, in unserer Liga zu spielen. Und jeder, der was anderes behauptet, ja, der hat einfach das andere Eishockey noch nicht gesehen und noch nicht miterlebt. Und das muss man sich einfach so vor Augen halten. Ähm, es ist eine ganz andere Intensität, eine ganz andere äh, physische Komponente bei diesen Turnieren. Äh, und das ist die Schwierigkeit, glaube ich, für, für so Nationen wie für Österreich, sich in relativ kurzer Zeit, sage ich mal, auf dieses Level zu bewegen. Ähm, was, und so muss ich jetzt ehrlich sagen, das, das scheint schier unmöglich. Ja, so, so in so einer kurzen Zeit. Weil Fakt ist schon, ja, die trainieren vielleicht nicht mehr als wir, aber die spielen ständig auf einem höheren Level und dementsprechend äh, adaptiert der Mensch, sage ich mal, weil wir ein anpassungsfähiges Säugetier sind. Ja, und die sind ständig konfrontiert mit solchen Situationen auf hohem Level und dessen, dementsprechend äh, sind sie halt dieses, dieses Level of Play auch gewohnt. Und äh, das gilt es für uns jetzt, sage ich mal, so schnell wie möglich in die Nähe, wenn nicht sogar auf dieses Level zu kommen, was schwierig sein wird. Und das macht auch die Aufgabe so schwierig. Ähm, und äh, ja, und sonst muss man das sehen wie eine Challenge. Äh, meine, meine Frage vorher war nicht, nicht unbedingt darauf gemünzt, ob du jemals aktiv mit dabei warst, sondern die AWM hat ja nie das beste Personal, weil die NHL im Regelfall nicht pausiert. Und hier hast du auf einmal bei der 20 wm wirklich die besten Jahrgänge und kannst dort jeweils aus dem, dem Vollen schöpfen. Du hast dieses Level of Play angesprochen, dass das bei AWM schon höher sein wird, dass auch bei der U20-WM sicher, sicher ein Faktor sein wird. Wie schafft man es, eine Mannschaft, wo viele Spieler drinnen sind, die, die diese, diese Geschwindigkeit und, und Entscheidungen unter, unter noch viel höherer Geschwindigkeit machen zu müssen, nicht gewohnt sind, das einzuimpfen? Ja, ich glaube, das, genau das ist die Herausforderung, Martin. Das ist... Äh ich glaube, man wird hauptsächlich die, die Zeit in St. Pölten ich mal, nützen, wie ich es angesprochen habe, um physisch zu belasten, um, um wirklich immer wieder Zeitdruck, Raumdruck ich mal, zu erzeugen und dort einfach die Jungs ich mal, ständig äh, competen zu lassen, wenn ich das so sagen darf. Und dann hat man natürlich zwei Testspiele, wo man das erste Mal sieht, hey, wo, wo stehen wir, wo sind wir. Und umso mehr Spiele wir ich mal, auf so einem Niveau ich mal, bekommen würden, ähm, umso, umso besser wäre es, äh, umso mehr Zeit hätten wir, sagen wir mal, dort zu adaptieren und zu uns zu gewöhnen. Aber natürlich, äh, Russland fährt mit dieser U20-Mannschaft aus den Kajala Cup und, und gewinnt das Turnier dort gegen die Erwachsenen aus Finnland, Schweden und so weiter. Also mh, 
ich glaube, wir wissen alle, von was wir reden. Die, die bereiten sie vor, für die ist das das Um und Auf. Wir wissen auch, was das für einen Stellenwert hat für diese großen Nationen, dieses Turnier. Also wir sind in der Gruppe mit äh, Nationen, die, die spielen nicht ums Viertelfinale, sondern die spielen um Gold. Und das müssen wir uns auch äh, irgendwo bewusst sein auf der einen Seite, aber auf der anderen Seite muss uns das alles scheißegal sein. Wir müssen uns schauen, dass wir uns bestmöglich vorbereiten, dass wir, dass, wir, dass wir wissen, wie wir spielen wollen und dann ja nicht starstruck sein, weil wir müssen frech sein. Wir müssen fast ein bisschen respektlos sein. Und so müssen wir an die Sache rangehen, weil sonst sind, sind wir die Verlierer. Wir sind schon Verlierer im Warm-up, wenn wir zu viel umschauen. Das ist mir oft genug passiert. Und das darf ja auch nicht passieren. Wir müssen da schauen, dass wir uns bestmöglich verkaufen und unsere Leistung so gut wie möglich abrufen können. Und dann schauen wir, was wir, dann, dann bilanzieren wir. Dann schauen wir, wo wir waren, wo wir stehen. Und, und so soll dieser Vergleich ab. Was, wir, ja, was ich mir wünsche für das Turnier ist wirklich, dass man dass man nicht, dass man vor lauter Nervosität oder vor lauter Starstruckness, dass man ver vergessen, unsere, unsere Leistung, unsere Beste möglich abzurufen. Das wäre meine nächste Frage nämlich gewesen, wie man es einer Truppe versucht einzuimpfen, wenn, wenn, man, wenn man jetzt einfach nur den nüchternen Blick auf, auf die Gruppeneinteilung macht und es wäre de facto wurscht, in welcher Gruppe Österreich gelandet wäre. Die allermeisten Nationen sind außer Reichweite. Aber jetzt haben wir mit Russland, Schweden, USA drei absolute Powerhouses bekommen und, und Tschechien ist im Regelfall auch nowhere near the Austrian level of play. Wie, 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 wie schafft man es, Spielern zu vermitteln, macht's das, seid nicht starstruck, die anderen sind zwar viel besser, Ihr habt keine Chance, aber nutzt sie. Ja. Das ist jetzt, das ist jetzt so, so sehr, sehr drastisch ausgedrückt. Nein, aber es, ich glaube, dass das eine Riesenrolle spielen wird. Also ich finde es eine gute Frage, weil das nicht einfach ist. Für den einen wird es vielleicht anders sein als für den anderen. Und jeder ist da komplett unterschiedlich. Wenn ich ein bisschen aus meiner Erfahrung erzählen darf, meine erste AWM habe ich spielen dürfen mit 19 Jahren in St. Petersburg. Naja, da ist mir das nicht besonders gut gelungen. Wenn ich da Timo Selane im Speisesaal gesehen habe, was uns jetzt gut sagen nicht passieren wird aufgrund von Covid-Maßnahmen, aber äh, lauter Jungs, die ich eigentlich gesehen habe, von nur von Highlight-Videos, sind auf einmal da neben mir gestanden oder sind im Lift mit dir gefahren. Und ich, in meiner ersten WM habe ich das überhaupt nicht auf die Reihe gebracht. Da war ich sehr, sehr starstruck. Und ähm, ich glaube, die, äh, sprechen wir es einmal so verallgemeinern wir es, aber. Ich glaube, die neue Generation, diese, diese Upcoming Generation, die jungen Spieler von heute, die sind da ein bisschen mehr careless, wenn ich so sagen darf. Ja? Die kennen zwar wahrscheinlich alle die und ich hoffe, dass die aber mit einem gewissen Selbstvertrauen und sagen, was du was, fuck it, dem zeige ich es jetzt. Ja? Und so mit, mit so einem Mindset sollten, müssen sie ja an die Sache gehen. Aber wie gesagt, ähm, jeder Spieler wird das anders irgendwie handeln und das gilt es natürlich zu beobachten und den Jungs zu vermitteln, hey Jungs, wir haben schon verdient, hier zu spielen. Und das müssen wir uns bewusst sein. Und ich glaube auch, dass das ganz wichtig ist, dass man das kommuniziert zu den Spielern. Wir haben uns das erarbeitet, dass wir an dem Turnier spielen dürfen. Und mit diesem Mindset müssen wir da hergehen und nicht sagen, ich kenne die meisten gegnerischen Spieler nicht. Ich weiß nicht, wer da jetzt im Draft war. Ich weiß, dass Marco Rossi und Timo Nickel und äh, Benny Baumgartner im Draft waren. Und das ist für mich das Wichtigste. Aber äh, wer da jetzt auf Russland-Seiten da in die Top 10 war oder wer von den Schweden getraftet worden ist, das ist alles äh, good news, aber es interessiert mich nicht. Mir interessieren meine Jungs oder unsere Jungs. Und denen gilt es einfach, für mich ist wichtig, ich hoffe, dass äh, wir das schaffen als Team, dass die Jungs jeder persönlich seine, seine, seine beste Leistung abrufen können. Und das, ist, das sehe ich auch als Hauptaufgabe für uns Coaches. Das ist Coaches, there's only so much you can do, das, das weiß man dann schon auch, weil am Ende die Mannschaft sich natürlich auch untereinander organisieren muss. Von wem erwartest du, dass er quasi mannschaftsintern auch durchaus Führungsanspruch übernimmt? Beziehungsweise wie, wie ortest du Leader in der Mannschaft, mit dem du selber über zwei Jahrzehnte in deinem Team sorgst? Um, ist, ist echt eine gute Frage, weil ähm, seit unserem letzten Zusammenzug, ich war ja im November in St. Pölten leider nicht dabei, ähm, ist ja schon wieder einige Zeit vergangen, aber das, das, das ist wirklich interessant, sowas zu beobachten. Oftmals hat man was im, im Kopf und eine Vorstellung, die nachher schlussendlich, wenn man sich das eine Woche oder zwei anschaut, ganz, ganz eine andere ist. Ja? Ähm, also vielleicht hat man wen einen Spieler oder eine Person ganz anders kategorisiert, was vom Leadership her ist, 
und wird dann überrascht, weil jemand anderer komplett in diese Rolle hineinrutscht und der andere, der vielleicht das, dem das gar nicht so liegt oder vielleicht auf eine ganz eine andere Art und Weise führt. Äh, Fakt ist es schon, dass äh, wir doch einige Spieler dabei haben, die letztes Jahr äh, beim Aufstieg dabei waren und äh, Uh, auch einige Spieler, die sogar im Jahr davor in Füssen schon dabei waren und uh, natürlich erhoffen wir uns von, von den Spielern einen, davon möchte ich jetzt auch nennen, ist Timo Nickel, der, uh, der eine tolle Entwicklung in den letzten zwei Jahren gemacht hat und uh, wo wir uns sehr freuen über das und wo wir uns natürlich auch erhoffen, dass er nicht nur mit seinem Level of Play, weil er auch in Nordamerika spielt, aber auch Uh, auch der Typ, der er ist, uh, so schätze ich ihn ein, uh, dass er uns da auf dem Sektor Leadership vor allem sehr, sehr helfen uh, wird, wird können oder der Mannschaft auch helfen wird können. Um, Marco Rossi kann ich natürlich uh, schwer einschätzen, weil ich ihn so noch nicht kennengelernt habe, aber natürlich uh, sein Level of Play alleine uh, wird ihm, verschafft ihm einen Status in der Mannschaft uh, und uh, und ganz wichtig auch, dass er diese Rolle auch vom Eis weg, sage ich mal, annimmt. Was man so hört, ist er ein sehr getriebener Spieler, der wirklich alles tut, um sein Bestmögliches immer wieder zu geben und geben zu können. Und das ist natürlich eine riesen Vorbildwirkung für, für jede Mannschaft. Und da helfen wir uns natürlich schon. Ein großes Problem der, der A-Nationalmannschaft war die, die letzten Jahre die, die generelle Füße. Es hat dann nicht nur Geschwindigkeit, aber, aber Größe, und Gewicht gemangelt, vor allem wenn man wirklich die, die Top-Nationen anschaut. Jetzt ist viel investiert worden in den vergangenen Jahren, es wird, es wird viel im Jugendbereich gemacht, aber schaut mal auf die anderen Nationen, schaut mal auf deren, deren Physis und adaptiert dementsprechend den, den Gameplan oder ist unsere Physis eh so toll, dass wir uns keine Sorgen machen müssen? Ja, <lacht> yeah, but you can't teach size, gell? sagt man immer. Und das ist wirklich so. Also Uh, wir haben halt da sicher nicht äh, diesen riesen Pool, wo wir auswählen können und schon gar nicht sagen, ha, was du, was der ist unter 80, gell? was du, was das hat keinen Sinn für dich, gell? du schwimmen oder irgendwas. Uh, das, das, das können wir da in Österreich nicht machen und ich glaube auch, uh, nicht nur diese Anforderung, aber das macht auch ein Coaching im Jugendalter oder im, im Nachwuchs um einiges schwieriger in Österreich. Also wir, müssen, wir können nicht selektieren wie andere Nationen. Wir haben eine gewisse Quantität zur Verfügung und aus dieser gilt es einfach, das Bestmögliche rauszuholen, diese, sage ich mal, äh, zu führen, um, äh, um, um zu, zu, zu guten Menschen, sage ich mal, erst zu machen und dann zu guten Athleten, ihnen was fürs Leben mitzugeben, weil einfach die Quote eine sehr, sehr niedrige ist, aus welchen Nachwuchsspielern schlussendlich wirklich äh, Spieler werden, die schlussendlich äh, später ihr Geld damit verdienen. Ja? Aber ich glaube, äh, unter Anbetracht der Tatsachen äh, muss man hier einfach sein Bestes geben. Aber natürlich schaut man auf die andere Seite. Und äh, wir waren auch zum Beispiel letztes Jahr in Minsk, glaube ich, körperlich äh, nicht die Größten und auch nicht die Schwersten. Und trotzdem haben wir irgendwo ein, einen Weg gefunden, sage ich mal, da äh, Weißrussland äh, zu ärgern im ersten Spiel und auch die Letten, sage ich mal, dann in einem, äh, ja, vielleicht Jahrzehnte Spiel sogar zu besiegen. Also ähm, ich sag, man muss mit dem arbeiten, was man hat. Und auch wenn man da mal unterlegen ist, dann äh, gilt es, sage ich mal, andere Wege zu finden, wie man mit Disziplin, äh, Work Ethic, also Arbeitseinstellung, äh, hier, sage ich mal, äh, zum Ziel kommt. Und auch natürlich Struktur gehört dazu. Ja. Es gibt immer wieder Sagen, obwohlerweise so, so goldene Generationen. Österreich hat vor allem auf A-Nationalteam-Niveau sehr lange von der, von der 83er-Generation, ähm, vom 83er-Jahrgang gezehrt, die Setzingers, die Kochs dieser Welt, die, die Harans, die, die, die Patricks. Und folglich ist ein wenig auch das, das Fahrstuhl-Dasein eingetreten oder hat sich dann, dann manifestiert. Es, es sind immer wieder punktuell Talente nachgekommen, aber nicht im großen Stil. Irgendwann sind die Akademien eingezogen worden. Salzburg, Klagenfurt, Wien, die Eishockey-Akademie Steiermark. In Linz wird jetzt Aufbauarbeit betrieben und auch irgendwann da Output gegeben. Soweit du das beurteilen kannst, ist der Output der Akademien schon spürbar? Puh. <lacht> um. Ja, teilweise schon. Denk, teilweise denke ich schon. Ähm, also muss ich, jetzt, ich muss jetzt vorsichtig sein, weil ich kann natürlich nicht 
äh, im Detail beurteilen, wie in den einzelnen Akademien gearbeitet wird. Was für mich auffällig ist, ist schon, äh, dass, und das muss ich so sagen, ich habe das Gefühl, ohne jetzt wissentlich alles zu wissen, wie es in der Organisation losgeht, aber ich glaube, dass Klagenfurt sehr, sehr viel richtig macht. Ich glaube, dass ich habe sie gestern noch wieder spielen sehen, in, in, in der Eishockey-League-Mannschaft und ähm, hier, ist, hier ist eine Handschrift zu sehen ja. und hier sieht man auch, wie junge Spieler Fortschritte machen und äh, nicht nur körperlich, aber auch im, im spielerischen Aspekt und, äh, und äh, das ist das Einzige, was ich wirklich beurteilen kann, äh, äh, was man so sieht, was da rauskommt. Ja. Viele Spieler hauen ja dann doch ab, relativ äh, früh, äh, vor allem die Vorarlberger äh, versuchen es dann oftmals gern in der Schweiz und äh, wir haben es auch jetzt gesehen, dass junge Spieler äh, Timo Nickel, um nur einen zu nennen oder äh, Hochhecke zum Beispiel, die den Schritt nach Nordamerika in die, in die Junior Ligen, sage ich mal, äh, gewagt haben und, äh, und äh, finde ich super. Also ich glaube, hier beurteilen zu können, wirklich wie es in jeder einzelnen Akademie äh, zugeht, äh, wäre jetzt äh, vage für mich und äh, möchte ja nicht. Es geht morgen Sonntag für dich in die Bubble. Es geht am 13. Dezember nach Edmonton. Auch dort sind es erst einmal sieben Tage Isolation mit vielen hoffentlich dann auch negativen äh, PCR-Tests. Es gibt dann zwei Testspiele. Und wann erfolgt der Cut nach diesen Testspielen? Ja, also der erste Cut habe ich angesprochen, ist in, äh, Ende der Woche in St. Pölten und dann äh, geht es rüber nach Edmonton und dann kommt eigentlich äh, für mich fast ein bisschen eine entscheidende, nicht entscheidende Phase, aber eine schwierige Phase auf die Jungs zu Wir sind wirklich vier Tage lang in Quarantäne, wirklich, es ist uns nicht erlaubt, das Hotelzimmer zu verlassen. Ähm, und ja, die eigenen vier Wände, die können dann relativ eng werden nach einer Zeit und vier Tage für mich selber, ich habe mich schon damit beschäftigt, äh, wie und wir versuchen auch, sage ich mal, uns damit zu beschäftigen als Coaching-Staff, wie, be wie geben wir den Tagen der Spieler, sage ich mal, Struktur, wie schaffen wir es, dass sie sich relativ schnell auf die Zeitumstellung äh, einstellen und äh, ohne, dass sie jetzt wirklich, wenn normalerweise gehst aus und gehst auf einen Walk oder gehst spazieren oder irgendwas, aber der Spaziergang im eigenen Zimmer, der ist halt dann sehr limitiert und äh, ähm, hier wollen wir irgendwie was, äh, eine Struktur in den Tag der Spieler reinbringen, ähm, damit das Ganze, ja, damit sie nicht nur, sagen wir mal, dort sitzen, Chips essen, so wie wir gesagt haben, und Playstation spielen, ja, weil das äh, wird dann relativ äh, kontraproduktiv sein für eine physisch doch äh, sehr, sehr anspruchsvolle Leistung nachher. Ähm, und nachher haben wir einige Trainingseinheiten. Wir, Dadurch, dass wir dann doch vier Tage im Zimmer waren, glaube ich, haben wir zwei Tage, an denen wir zweimal am Tag auch, auch auf das Eis nützen können. Ähm, was gut sein wird, dass wir ein bisschen den, den Rust oder den Zement der Belobe bringen von den Jungs und, ähm, und werden dann äh, zwei Testspiele haben. Eins gegen Deutschland, eins gegen die Slowakei und nach diesen zwei Testspielen gibt es dann den letzten Cut. Ähm, so unerfreulich dafür zwei Spieler sein wird, ist er notwendig und äh, diese Entscheidung ist nie eine einfache, aber da wird noch der letzte Cut stattfinden. Ich glaube dann äh, ist Heiligabend, glaube ich, <lacht> wird auch mal was Neues sein äh, und dann geht es eigentlich relativ bald ins Turnier. Jetzt kennst du die Situation auch aus eigener Erfahrung, was beim, beim Team auch des, des Öfteren und Olympia 2002 fällt einem da wahrscheinlich als erstes ein on the bubble, wenn du jetzt als Spieler in der Bubble, on the bubble bist und, und du, du weißt, du könntest diese, diese unerfreulichen Nachrichten überstellt bekommen. Wie bereitet man sich da auch im Coaching-Staff mental darauf vor, diesem Spieler potenziell diese, diese Nachricht zu überbringen? Nehmen wir an, du müsstest es machen. Wie würdest du es anlegen, auch im Wissen, es ist dir selbst widerfahren? Ja, natürlich habe ich eine gewisse Empathie, wenn man das Ganze selbst äh, miterlebt hat. Äh, und vielleicht verschafft man das ein bisschen einen Vorteil. Äh. Wie, wie hätte ich das gern vor knapp 20 Jahren gehabt, dass man das mit mir kommuniziert? Oder wie, äh, wie hätte ich das gern, hätte man das anders gestalten können? Schlussendlich äh, ist es eine schwierige Message, die man... Äh, die man vermitteln muss an einen Athleten, der dann auch enttäuscht sein wird. 
der dann auch eine lange Heimreise antreten muss, mit vielleicht im besten Fall einem anderen Kollegen. Es ist keine leichte Aufgabe, es ist eine Aufgabe, die einfach zum Job dazugehört, die, die erledigt gehört. Ganz wichtig ist Ehrlichkeit. Let's not beat around the bush. Es ist so. Und das Nächste, was wichtig ist, ist Feedback. Ehrliches Feedback ist ganz, ganz viel wert für jeden Athleten. Ja. Und äh, wie der dann damit umgeht, ähm, und ich glaube, das gilt auch für die normale Arbeitswelt, ja. äh, das gilt einfach als Coach auch zu akzeptieren. Der eine ist angepisst und das ist gut so. Der andere nimmt es und sagt, weißt du was, ja, ich weiß auch, dass ich vielleicht äh, da noch nicht ganz so weit bin. Jeder geht damit um, mit, dieser, mit diesem Feedback oder mit dieser Message oder mit dieser, ja, wie auch immer wir das nennen wollen, mit dieser Entscheidung, wie, wie er das in dem Moment empfindet. Und da ist alles, da ist nichts richtig und nichts falsch, meines Erachtens. Und das, das gilt es auch zu akzeptieren. Jetzt wäre es ohnehin ein oder kein ganz normales Weihnachtsfest äh, unter dem covid 19 der Mokleschwert, äh, unter dem wir, wir alle dann, dann leben. Für dich ist es aber noch einmal erschwerend, weil du nicht nur an Weihnachten nicht zu Hause sein wirst, nicht nur an Silvester nicht zu Hause sein wirst, sondern auch noch zwei Wochen vor. Also du bist fast den kompletten Monat von, von Familie, Freunden, dem gewohnten Umfeld entfernt. Und es geht ja nicht nur dir so, es geht den Spielern so, es geht dem Rest des coaching staffs so. Wie bereitest du dich auf diese Situation vor? Ja, das ist ganz, ganz schwierig, glaube ich, dass man sich auf sowas vorbereitet, weil man das ja eigentlich nicht, noch nicht erlebt hat. Also das wird für uns alle eine neue Situation und umso wichtiger ist, sage ich mal, für uns mit Offenheit an das Ganze zu gehen, ja, weil wir sind alle verschieden in unserer Spielern, Coaches, in unserer eigenen Art, wie wir die Dinge handeln. Und auch hier gilt, sage ich mal, nicht nur einen, äh, sage ich mal, einen Fahrplan zu geben und äh, da fährt die Eisenbahn drüber, sondern das irgendwie, sage ich mal, auch heranzuleiten, dass da auch unterschiedliche Wege gibt, wie man sich bestmöglich vorbereitet und die jetzt auch, sage ich mal, als Coach, sage ich mal, teilweise zu, zu akzeptieren, solange sie in einem gewissen Rahmen drin bleiben. Ja. Ich habe es angesprochen, nur Playstation und Chips und, und Snacken den ganzen Tag und so. Das ist schwer für mich zu akzeptieren, aber muss jeder Freak sein wie ich und äh, gleich in der Früh sage ich, so viel Schluckeln und, und, und Wasser nehmen und dann gleich Mobility machen und schauen, dass man beweglich bleibt in in, in Body and Mind und so weiter. Ich meine, übertreibe jetzt ein bisschen, ich bin ein ganz so ein Freak, aber ja, ich habe meine Rituale, aber ich bin auch 41 Jahre mittlerweile und das zu äh, erwarten von einem ja, 17, 18, 19-Jährigen, ähm, dass die schon so eine Struktur in ihrem äh, Alltag haben, ist, glaube ich, ein bisschen viel verlangt, aber da gilt es, das Ganze vielleicht ein bisschen zu coachen, Ideen zu vermitteln und, und schauen, vielleicht wird das eine oder andere auch angenommen und vielleicht hilft es ihnen dann und dann hat man schon sehr viel erreicht. Es ist natürlich schwer zu, zu prognostizieren. Wir sind noch äh, über drei Wochen vom Turnier an sich äh, entfernt. Das Turnier an sich wird dann auch sehr schnell ähm, passiert sein, möglicherweise. Egal, wann der Rückflug dann auch wirklich geht. Vielleicht gibt es ja auch Überraschungen. Aber was muss passiert sein? Was willst du gesehen haben, um zu sagen, das war ein gutes Turnier für Österreich? Ja, äh, was, will ich, was will ich sehen? Also abgesehen jetzt vom, vom Ergebnis, wir natürlich unter uns Coaches, wir haben schon ein bisschen drüber gesprochen, was sind unsere Ziele. Ähm, ich glaube, das Wichtigste aller Ziele ist jetzt, äh, ähm, das Resultat jetzt einmal vorweg zu lassen, weil das Resultat für uns alle ist klar. Und wir würden uns freuen, auch wenn du es angesprochen hast, wie lang von unseren eigenen Familien weg sind und Weihnachten versäumen, Neujahr versäumen. Wir würden uns freuen, wenn wir dort so lang wie möglich bleiben können bis Turnierende. Und das wäre eigentlich nur möglich, wenn wir in der Gruppenphase ein Spiel gewinnen können beziehungsweise ins Viertelfinale das schaffen. Das ist der große Traum. Das ist der Dream. Ja. Und genauso wie letztes Jahr der Traum war, aufzusteigen, ist das der Dream. Und, und ich glaube, der ist auch wichtig, den zu haben. Also wenn wir resultatorientiert denken, dann ist das so mein Traum. Ja. Ich glaube, nicht nur für mich selber, aber auch für die Jungs. Und äh, 
Ähm, aber abgesehen davon habe ich es vorher schon angesprochen, ich glaube, sollten wir das nicht schaffen und wir, wir fliegen nach dem Turnier zurück und, und wir können sagen, wir haben wirklich das Gefühl, dass jeder einzelne Spieler dort es geschafft hat, ähm, sein maximales Potenzial abzurufen und wir haben ihnen die Möglichkeit für das gegeben, dann ist das sehr, sehr viel wert. Und dann, also das ist so mein nicht, mein nicht resultatorientiertes Ziel für die, für die Mannschaft und auch für uns Coaches, weil dann könnten wir, ich glaube, dann, dann würde ich heimfliegen mit einem guten Gefühl. Ja. Und das ist für mich eigentlich das Hauptziel. Und genau damit lassen wir das auch am Ende des Podcasts stehen. Wir werden im Rahmen von Hockey O'Clock mit Martin Pfanner, dem U20-Team, dann auch während dem Turnier immer wieder Bedeutung zumessen, immer wieder Inhalte und Gespräche liefern. Dir erst einmal alles Gute in Edmonton und vielen lieben Dank, dass du vor dem, vor, Bubble, vor dem Gang in die Bubble so lange Zeit genommen hast. Ja, danke an dich, Martin, und äh, ja, freue mich aufs nächste Mal. Hi, Hockey-Fans, this is Greg Holst, Hockey O'Clock 101. We would like to hear your suggestions on great stories or stories you would like to hear. If you have great ideas, please send in your suggestions. And if you are picked, you will win a Hockey O'Clock t-shirt. Please send in your suggestions to hockeyoclock101 at gmail.com. Very glad to have him back for a now record third time on <laughs> Hockey O'Clock. He's a dear acquaintance of the podcast. He's a student of the game. He's the winningest coach in Austrian First League history of the past 20 years. He's Rob Dauman now on Hockey Clock. Coach, thanks again for taking the time. It's always my pleasure, Martin. Coach, this time around, we decided to break down another team. I, I put um, a poll out on, on Twitter. And, and ask fans which, after you broke down KC's power play roughly a month ago, uh, which other team of the Bed at Home Ice Hockey League fans want to be or want to have broken down. And Linz led for such a, a long period of time that you started doing your homework on Linz. And at the very last second of the vote, um, your other old team, so to speak, uh, surpassed Linz by one measly vote so um even even though i i can imagine and there's a certain irony to it that that fans would really like you to break down philo's system we we instead this time around chose chose Linz because you put in so much work and and we're gonna save um the faust file for for another time hope that's okay for you well it's okay for me I, it's just like the u.s election you know just because you who knows who's gonna win um, no, I appreciate that. And, and I'll definitely, you know, I have no problem talking about Bilak at a later time. So, you know, I appreciate the fact that the, the fans will allow you to let me talk about Linz today. And we, if we get a chance to do this again, that uh, if Bilak is a team people wish to look at or want me to look at, I have no problem with that at all. So I appreciate uh, uh, you making the concession and let me uh, look at Linz today. This is going to be roughly a, a, a monthly part or a once a month part of the, the, the podcast that, that of course, until you, you might have uh, another full time assignment. Speaking of which, the last two times that we, that we talked in the podcast, uh, we, we touch base with you being in Europe. Now, this time around, we're working on, on an eight hour, hour time difference. Why, why are you back in, in, in Canada right now? I was in Hungary working at a, a sport academy. Um, and everything was going, you know, going well. And, and they were treat, they treated me really well there. I really enjoyed the time I spent there, but I caught a virus. Um, and it, it wasn't, it wasn't COVID, but I caught a virus and, and, uh, I wasn't feeling particularly well. And each day things just seemed to be getting worse. And I felt just, uh, it would be wise because, uh, uh, just to get home and, and get that out of my system. Um, so, I, I flew back to Canada October uh, October 28th and just took a little time to to get the, all of that back in order. I found out that uh, again I tested as soon as I got back for COVID. Found out that that wasn't the case. I had something else, but uh, I just had to get over that. And it's unfortunate because, like I say, I was treated really well in Hungary and was enjoying what was happening there. But 
you know, you know, just the circumstances made me think it was best for, you know, to come home to Canada and, and uh, make sure I, I got, uh, I got over the virus. Now uh, we're going to talk in, uh, in this episode, we're going to talk about your old team, the Black Wings of Linz or the Steinbach Black Wings 1992, as they're now officially called. How strong and granted it's been a couple of years, uh, are, are, are your ties to, to, to Linz still? They're, they're really, really strong, Martin. I can't, I can't, um, you know, I can't, I can't deny that. Um, I spent six years there and it was my second home and we had some, a lot of success and, and uh, it was, uh, it was a, it was a great part of my life and really enjoyed it. So it breaks my heart to see what's, what's, uh, what's happening uh, there now, because I still have very, very strong uh, emotional ties to, uh, to the city and, and the team and the organization. How have you followed all the turmoil others would call it chaos that that's un unfolded from, from, from March onwards? What, what are you making of the, the current situation? Well, I followed it I, I, because, you know, I feel so strongly towards the team in Lentz. I followed it really closely. I didn't, I, I just followed it online. Uh, I didn't talk to anybody that was directly involved um, with the, with the chaos and chaos is a really good word. Um, and so, but I had a, you know, I have a real good understanding of the personalities involved, the people involved. So I, you know, I, I, I can understand how things transpired as they did understanding all the dynamics and all the personalities involved. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was really, and every, it was really sad to see and, And, um, you know, hopefully uh, the organization can regain its strength and get back to where uh, it was previously and where it should be. Because, I mean, hockey has, has proven that it, it's, uh, that Linz is a great hockey city. And, um, you know, hopefully it, it'll get back to that, that point where the, everybody's on the same page. When you came into the, the league and we came to Linz in 2011, I, I know one of your big, big points of emphasis was to never lose two games in a row, um, which I think you, you've succeeded fairly well with uh, and, and you wrote that, that, that streak to, to a championship. But, but just, just out of curiosity, do you know what your longest losing streak as a Linz head coach was? You know what? That's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know, but I know it wasn't very many games. Uh, I, I can't tell you what it was. You probably know. I, I wouldn't have asked the question if I, if I did, <laughs> didn't know didn't know the answer. But would you want to you want to take a wild guess? I, I I couldn't even take a wild guess. I would I would say three or four games would be the longest losing streak we had. It happened in 2014. Um, in in the fall of 2014, you had a five-game losing streak okay. from October the 25th to November the 14th. I, I bring this up, this five-game losing streak, because on separate incidents, Linz has already had two five-game losing streaks this year. So, so what are you making of the of the season Linz has been playing so far? Well. They're in last place, and and I think that it pains me. I, I think they've earned it. You know, sometimes sometimes you're in last place because I mean you're ravaged with injuries or so many outside things come into play. But that hasn't been the case with 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 their team this year. Even even COVID uh, of all the teams in the league, it's probably hit le Lintz the least from what I can understand. Looking at at um, you know what everybody's talking about. And all you have to do is is look at the numbers. You just look at the numbers of, of the team. They've they've got 34 goals for it. I think they played 16 games. So that's that's just over two goals a game, which um, you're not going to win a lot of games doing that. And and they've given up 55 goals. And then their 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 differentials. I mean, minus 21. And this is only in a 16 game period. And um, they're they're Their special teams are, are are decent. Their power play's been effective. It's it's sixth in the league, which is which is which is fine. That's acceptable. Their penalty killing is fourth. So the special teams have uh, have done their job. Uh, but five on five, 
they just uh, they just haven't gotten it done. And to me, Lens is two di- two different teams. When Leveller and Human Civic are on the ice, they're one team, and when everybody else is on the ice, they're a completely different team. And um, you know, I think that that's one of the things that that really. You know, they, they, their their depth of production is non-existent. It just is, uh, and, and the way they play. I mean, you, Pacific Leveler, uh, they they play a certain way, and and the rest of the team um, plays plays differently. And and their goaltending has been uh, been only average. Um, the numbers are okay for for the goalies, but um, you know, I, I've watched a, a number of games, and they always seem to give up a bad goal. The game in Graz, for example. Lintz is leading one to nothing. There's a bad goal. It makes it one, one. I'm watching the game with Innsbruck. It's, it's two, nothing, which is a very manageable deficit. And all of a sudden there's a bad goal and it's three, nothing. And so the combination of all of these things puts you in last place. Normally, if you do have the league's top goal scorer and the league's uh, top assistant, one might assume that you're not a last place team. You named, you named, Many reasons for for Linz not not being successful, but but what's the the most drastic thing that that really ails them? Well, I think that, uh, for me, I'm I'm just going to look at at uh, their lack of production on offense, and and the lack of time they spend in the other team's end, and um, I think that's to me the 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 main the main problem um, with their team if, if you can't score um, or or if you're you know if, if, if you if you if you can't defend then you better spend as much time as you can on the opponent's end and I, I just don't think they do a good enough job of sustaining time in 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 the, the opponent's zone I watched uh, when I was watching the game in Graz, They spent no time in Gratz's end in the first six minutes of the game, like zero time in the zone. It was always in the zone briefly. Gratz would make one pass and they're out of the zone. And so you're spending the whole time defending. And, uh, you know, that's uh, that's a tough way to play unless your goaltender is playing extremely well. Um And, and uh, you know, you're relying on that and then you have other ways to, to score enough goals to win. But unfortunately, Lynn's defensive play doesn't allow them to do that. We're going to break down a, a, a couple of plays and you brought along six clips with you that we're going to put on Pulse24.at slash Ice hockey. The link's going to be in the show notes of the podcast, anyways. Uh, but before that, I um, want to talk about you, uh, about another thing. Um, Laola, one columnist, Bernd Freimüller, who's also uh, a, a scout in, in, in his other life, he recently published an article, kind of a power ranking, put the Black Wings in, in last place and really put the hammer down on, on the, the class of imports that they brought in and, and other imports that that were there when you were there with uh, uh, like, like Pichet and, and, and Kozak and and la- labeled them as, as one of the root causes for, for the many, many problems. How would you assess the, the quote-unquote free agency that, that Linz had in, in summer? Well, it was a disaster. Um, and I can't... Uh, I had the opportunity to read Berens' uh, Uh, call him, and I can't disagree with him on anything that that he, that he said. And I hate to do that because I hate to agree with Baron. Uh, I know him pretty well, and and uh, we have the odd conversation. It's always interesting to talk to him. So to agree with him is something that's very very difficult for me. But if you look at Pichet's got zero. The, the, the defense in Lynch has two goals total. Two goals in 16 games. Pichet has zero goals. Dorian has zero goals. Big parts uh, of what was going to be an offense on the defensive side of the of the game, and they haven't been able to generate anything. They, they each have five assists. And I can understand if you bring back the Dorian and Pichet of their prime, then obviously Lintz probably isn't in last place, 
and uh, the, the production is different because they're going to help generate the offense and, and the wins are going to come. Kozik has one goal. And I, I mean, I love all these guys because I worked with them for an extended period of time and I have a great deal of respect for them as people and players. But right now, they're not producing. For Andrew Kozik to have one goal is, I mean, it's mind-boggling because, uh, you know, it, it, he's as good a shooter as there is potentially in the league. But with, with, with Andrew, he needs a setup man. He needs people to get him to puck in the right place. I mean, if he's playing with Yuma Civic, uh, he's probably got who knows how many goals, uh, uh, but he doesn't have that. And that goes back to the building of your team. You have to know what you have, uh, what your players are good at, and then you have to complement them with players that allow them to, to play to their strengths. Um, and that, that uh, you know, that if you look at uh, their defense as a whole, um, they're not big. They're not fast. They're not physical. So they really, they're not skilled. So there's a, when you, when you put your team together, you need a variety of different things up front and on the back end. And unfortunately, I don't see that with, with the personnel uh, of Lentz. And I mentioned earlier, uh, they play, they're, they're two different teams. When Yuma Civic's line is on the ice, they're, they're a dangerous team. And unfortunately, in my opinion, when anybody else is on the ice, um, they're they're not uh, overly effective. And uh, you know, and you look at their forwards; they're not fast, they're not strong, they're not physical, they're not skilled. So, uh, I mean, this paints a pretty ugly picture. But right now, I mean, that's that's just the way things seem to be with with, with the team. Gonna take a, a, a quick detour to, to American football where one of the most successful coaches ever in Bill Belichick has uh, a philosophy of letting people go a year too early rather than a year too late. And and Linz not only holds on to, to players pretty pretty long, which kind of is a credit to, to them and, and, and speaks for the loyalty, but this year chose to to bring him back another root cause for all the problems well i i i think so i think so i think i don't think there's any question they're not producing at the level they need to produce at. and uh, the one the one thing when you when you bring people in you bring people back you know their personalities and that's a real you know that's a real positive because you know they're going to be good in the room you know you know what they're going to bring but the import players in any league have to produce they have to have a dimension to their game they have to have something that they do special that helps the team be successful and when you look at dorian and pichet they're ticketed as offensive defensemen and produ helping produce the offense and when that doesn't happen then you know then then you get what you get and uh, so from a from a personality perspective you understand why maybe they make that move because there's a familiarity there But you, um, you need the production on the ice more than you need the uh, cohesiveness or the the good guyness um, in you know in the dressing room. We're talking extensively about the the defensive problems that keep bugging Lintz. If if you're starting to build a, a defense from from scratch, what's the the first kind of kind of person, first kind of player you're looking for? I I, I take a wild guess and say right handed shot. Power play uh, and and stay at home defender all all in the same from 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 a skill set. How would you how how does your perfect defender the first signee look like? He's a he's a right handed power play defenseman that can produce offensively. And um, I mean Curtis Murphy, my first year in Linz, that's the guy you want. Uh, I mean, you always want highly competitive players. Da 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 da. But from a skill set, power play defenseman, right-handed shot, uh, did it all offensively. That's the type of player that um, that you're looking for as your as your number one guy. And we talked about it in our previous podcast about the right-handed shooting defenseman. He's so valuable because there's so few uh, right-handed shooters to begin with, and to get a skilled one, he's he's just uh, worth whatever you can pay him. 
to summarize uh, a lot of a lot of things that that keep bugging the the the, the black wings uh, a less than uh, ideal import class this year um, paired with a rookie GM and and a rookie head coach no no knock on on anyone just just stating stating the obvious um, which brings me to the the rookie the rookie head coach at the very least rookie in in terms of the bed at home ice hockey league in his first full time season as as a head coach with Pierre Beaulieu from what you've seen how does he he want to play well it, he's I, I would he's more of a he's more of a conservative coach he's not um, he's they're 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 soft on the forecheck they're not pinching their defensemen a lot they're thinking defense first they're thinking defense first uh same thing in the neutral zone they're they're sending one man always um and then they're making sure they've always got guys back when i watch the players forecheck you can see that they're thinking defense first they're they're taking steps back ready to defend rather than being on their toes, ready to attack. And so, and, and, um, uh, I would, I would suggest that, uh, you know, he's more on that scale, he's more defensive oriented and, and plays a more conservative defensive game. Now, Pierre Beaulieu, yeah. as, as a player was a goaltender, as, uh, an assistant uh, coach, he, he used to man the, the, the obviously the, the, the goaltenders. He was a video coach. Um, so maybe that explains, the the defensive focus would you would you be able to to identify one's background from from the style he he, he wants his team to play i don't think so um i i think that coaches want what you're a player and then you become a coach and and you evolve in the process and i don't think your personality as a player necessarily transfers i'm sure it does on 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 some occasions, that's obviously it would, but I don't think it's a, a general uh, necess necessity that that would that that would be the case. Just just from from the school of of, of thought behind one system, what, where would you where would you see uh, Pierre's system, and where does yours come from, and, and the various influences that you use to 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 tweak your game or the game you want to see? Well, it comes from you know experience. It comes from um, Uh, going through seasons and building teams and having success with particular types of teams and and uh, um, under you know sort of a personality that you have and at, at the way that you want to approach uh, that you that way you want to approach the game. So you always have to have a balance in the game. Um, you can't be solely aggressive because then you're going to live leave your ass uncovered. And you're going to give up too many odd man rushes and you're going to, you know, smart teams are going to pick you apart. Um, and, 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 uh, and so you have to, you have to find that balance. So you have to decide. Um, and again, it's, it's based on, it's, it's based on an evolution of your coaching and your experiences. You, you have a basic philosophy going in. And then you you're always looking to adjust your philosophy to make your team better and to make uh, to be able to execute better um, with with uh, as a coach. And for me, I come in with a very aggressive philosophy, um, and then it's just a choice you make. And and some of it depends on your personnel as well. You know, I I used to think that more so than I do now. Initially, I thought you you play your game based on your on the personality that you have, but I I I've changed my philosophy or my thinking on that a little bit. Your team will play with the mindset that you give them, and and the reason I say that is that if you have if you give your team an aggressive mindset, and you're going to play an aggressive style, they will play it regardless of the personnel that you have, because that's the direction that you're giving them. You know, I had a team in Houston um, and that I, I had uh, that played in the Minnesota uh, farm system. And Minnesota was notoriously 
defensive orientated with Jacques Lemaire, one of the best coaches in, in the history of hockey. But his philosophy was, we're not going to take any risks. We're, we're going to make sure we're really careful here. We're not going to take any chances and we're going to defend and we're going to defend and we're going to get our opportunities by good playing well defensively and capitalize on them. And I, and, and we had a team in Houston that my philosophy was completely different with the same type of players that they had in Minnesota. So my team in Houston, we're going to be on our toes and we're going to go. And we had some players that weren't great. We had Joel Ward, for example, who wasn't a great skater. Um, but if you have the proper mindset, you're going to be able to get your team to play a, a particular way. So, but when you build your team, if you have the ability to do so, you build your team with the understanding that that's the type of game you're going to play. So when, when I was in Linz, for example, uh, I had my philosophy and I would look for players that fit how I wanted to play. And that just obviously makes it uh, a lot easier. I would find the players that I thought could fit into what I wanted. And then, you know, I talked to Christian about it, Kurt Toller, and uh, then he would, uh, you know, he tried to make it happen from a contract perspective. Uh, and that's how we, we built the teams uh, in Lentz. Pierre, Pierre's been kind of thrust into uh, a situation where I don't know how much input he had into building the team. But I still think, based on what I've seen with his work in in Krefeld in the DEL, that his philosophy is more, more, um, you know, defense type orientated, um, rather than than the other way. And, and you can you can make the argument that I don't have enough skill to play an aggressive game, or I'm not quick enough, or whatever. But I've just rattled on, or rambled on here for three or four minutes, saying that I don't believe it's the skill set as much as the mindset that's instilled in the team. We're going to jump right into things after our measly 25-minute uh, lead-up to, to, to this. <laughs> you, <laughs> you brought along six, six clips that, that, that kind of kind of show what the, the, the current Steinbach Blackwings 1992 are, are all about, what, what, what ails them. And, and at the very same time, maybe, maybe it, it gives us an idea where there is room for, for improvement. All those six clips, just to mention it again, can be found on pulse24.at slash ice hockey. And the link to that website is going to be in the show notes for, for people who can't properly spell it. The very first clip that you brought along is an example of a breakout try from, from Linz. Could you lead me through, through, through what you've seen here? Well, basically, in, 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 the, in the first clip, what I'm, what I'm trying to focus on here in, in the clips that I've brought forward is, uh, is, is why Lentz is not scoring. Um, that's kind of the, the focus on it. And, and, I mean, they've scored 11 goals in the last eight games. And two of those goals have come on the power play. So they've scored nine goals in eight games without playing five on five. So... Uh, in the, in in these these um, clips, I'm trying to show, um, you know, how why they're having trouble making things happen offensively, and to score a goal, you score goals on you know five different ways basically. You score off the rush. You score when your forecheck has turned a puck over and you've got puck possession. You score when you've lost the puck on the forecheck and you reattack. To get it, um, which is another way you get puck possession in the offensive zone. You score on counterattacks where you play sound defense and turn pucks over and get a chance to attack again. Um, and then you, you score on the power play, obviously, and you score on faceoffs. And that's you know, that's the way you're going to score goals on this on, on the first clip that we've looked at that I've that I've identified is Uh, the preamble to this clip is Lentz has spent about 15 seconds uh, in their own zone where Gratz has moved the puck and maintained puck possession. Lentz has eventually turned the puck over and they're looking to break out of the zone and the three forwards have almost all left the zone already. So the defenseman has the puck, but he's got nobody to give it to. 
There's no easy pass. And if you have an unskilled defense, and we've sort of come to the conclusion that Lentz's defense is not overly skilled, you can't have defensemen trying to make difficult passes and also trying to, to beat people in their own zone, like trying to, to maintain puck possession. And what happens here is that Lentz's defenseman has the puck, the forwards are leaving the zone early, and Grass is able to reattack, turn the puck over, and Lentz spends some extra time inside the zone because of that. So that's the oh. the clip. Two follow-up questions to 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 this clip. So basically, what this clip would be showing is that your offense always starts in in your defense. It sounds so simple, but is is that the the, the root of, of 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 everything? Exactly it. If you don't spend any time in your end by making good, crisp, quality breakouts, you're you're going to be able to generate offense. Breaks out breakouts are the first step in generating offense. One thing Lintz does a good job of. Uh, in some ways, is, is they'll stretch. And in the game in Graz, for example, they got two or three real good chances because their, their one forward left the zone and was at the far blue line, and they were able to hit him with a pass. Uh, that happened a couple of different times. The downside to that is you got one less guy in your zone. And, uh, you know, if you're not able to make that pass, you're going to be spending a lot of time in your own end. You've, you've lost one option on the breakout. The, the eyes naturally move towards number 50, Niklas Tikkinen, who tries to obviously has the, the, the puck on his backhand, which isn't ideal. How could he have handled things differently? Was there a better way of, of dealing with the situation from, from Tikkinen's standpoint? Well, if the, if the forwards are closer to him and, and, and the breakout options are consistent, he, he knows, like, all he has to do then is make Uh, a two meter pass to uh, uh, probably heighten in the middle. And then, then, then you're out of the zone. So, you know, he didn't really, he had no options. He was left. And I guess that's the key, another key point in this clip, the forwards are leaving and not leaving the defense from any options. So now he's on an Island and uh, you know, there's not much, there's not much he can do without any options to move the puck up. So where, in this situation, one might deduct that it's a lack of individual skill that leads to the turnover. It's it's a, a systematic problem. Well, in that particular in that particular clip, I would suggest it's a systematic problem because the, the people are too far away from the puck. They're too far away from the puck, and uh, there's good defensemen make plays under pressure. The best way to make it easy for good or for for any player to make a play under pressure is to have to con consistent and close breakout options. If the breakout options are too far away, then a non-skilled player is going to make that play. If if they're and and if you're under pressure, you don't know where people are. But if it's consistent and it's driven home through practice and preparation. Even a defenseman going back for the puck knows I've got a guy over here, I've got a guy over here, I've got a guy over here, and I just have to make a short pass, and then we're, then we're going to be we're going to be fine. The other thing with Lintz, um, with their defensemen on the breakouts, is they always use the boards. They're always moving pucks up the boards. So I mean, the forechecking teams are feasting on that, uh, and and looking. I mean, it's it's always coming here. We're going to turn the puck over. We're going to spend another 10, 15 seconds inside the zone or longer. They tend to carry the puck back inside the zone because they don't have the 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 passing options uh, ready to them when they when they get the puck. So they look up. There's nothing there. So now they go back. And when you're going back, you're spending more time in your end. Two last questions regarding this this clip. How many how many different breakout? versions did you did you try to 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 practice try to instill with your team well there's not an infinite number of breakouts and when we're talking breakouts under pressure um i'm gonna say let's see there's there's a quick up there's a pop pass to the center there's a a d to d pass um so i i would say no there's more than that there'll be there'll be six to eight depending on the circumstances of the forecheck Because what the forecheck does determines what your, your first breakout pass is. You know, for example, if a team is checking a one two two, which means their first forward is going hard on the puck, their second forward is taking the boards away, and their third forward is, is towards the middle, 
well, you're not going to be able to make the pass up the boards. You're not going to be able to pass up the middle. So you're going to have to move the puck away from the pressure, which is D to D. Most teams on, on the initial four check, they're going to take the boards away. So very rarely are you going to just be able to make a quick pass up the wall because that's usually taken away. So then you're going to have to make a decision. Has their second four checker gone to the middle? Or has he gone and team has he gone to the other defenseman to take the DDD away? So you have to read the play as a defenseman. But what the defenseman needs to know is the options are going to be there all the time. Nobody's going to leave the zone early. Uh, the guy in the middle is going to be there being a good solid option for that little quick pass to beat the first four checker. Um, all of these things you want to have in place, and it's you you repeat them in practice so they become second nature within the game. So you you have to try and make practice these situations as game-like as possible so the defenseman has to be under pressure in practice so he gets accustomed to making those reads. I don't I don't my feeling is lots of time I don't give the defenseman a pass. You know, uh, well I'm under pressure, you know, so what? You, you have to be prepared to make the, you know, the right play under pressure because that's what good defensemen do. If you're not a good defenseman, then all you usually do then is just get the puck and either rim it around the boards or pass it up the boards and turn it over. And that goes back to building your team and having players that are capable to do, uh, of doing that. Now, how much time do you spend in practice on, 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 on really trying to, to get them Into, into a player system to, to, to have them like not, not even think about the, the, the breakouts anymore. How, how much time does it really take to instill this? Well, it, it takes, it, it, it takes, it takes time, but you work on it daily. So, um, you, you know, you work on it consistently and, it, and, and, uh, you, you get it quicker than, than you might think. Obviously, if you have a lot of returning players, it happens quicker. But it, it doesn't take that long as long as you're, you know, you're consistent in your approach in the drills that you do and you're paying attention to detail with the drills that you do. Um, so when you're doing uh, five on zero drills, for example, on the breakouts where there's no, you know, aggressive pressure, uh, you're making sure guys are in the right place. They're not just going through the motions with, with uh, you know, because there's no forechecking, they're not taking shortcuts. You know, you have to make sure that you're enforcing what you want in every drill that you do. Otherwise you're creating bad habits, but I'm, you know, personally as a coach, I'm a firm believer of, of putting pressure on and making it difficult for the defense in practice. So they can, you know, they can make those decisions and, and make those reads. And there's not just the, there's not just the, the breakouts off the initial four check. There's the breakouts. Once the puck is turned over, you know, then, you know, that that's sort of a, there, it's all the big picture, but that, that's sort of the different, Uh, setups that you have with your breakouts and then obviously the last one would be where you have your breakout where you have complete control behind the net and no pressure at all so we've already tackled a couple of keywords now we're going to put them together you said it's very important to put pressure on on uh the the player trying to to uh conduct the the, the breakout uh, we're going to turn our attention to video clip number two that you brought along it's an example of a forecheck or more or less a non-existent forecheck? You called it stationary forecheck. Why this labeling? Well, because they're set up, behind, the opponent is set up behind the net and you're not being aggressive on the forecheck. You can call it a control forecheck or a stationary forecheck. So you're basically setting up in your forechecking pattern uh, and then working from there. If you're aggressive forechecking, you're going and here you're stopping and then you're, you're stationary Uh, to start the four check because the other team has gained complete control behind the net. So that's why I call it stationary. Now what Graz does is uh, get, get through the neutral zone in, in no time and have an ozone uh, penetration with, with speed. What's obviously you, you want to take that away, but why is Linz playing this stationary four check? What are, or what might be advantages to it? Well, I mean, every team has a form, one or two forms of a stationary forecheck because there's going to be times in the game, no matter how aggressive you want to be with your forechecking, there's going to be times, circumstances where the other team has complete control. If you're aggressive, it doesn't happen often, but it might be a line change or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, some teams like to use this as a way to play with the lead, 
personally, I, I don't like that. I like to be more aggressive, even with the lead. I want to make sure I've maybe got three guys back um, rather than, you know, pinching defensemen or pinching forwards or those type of things. So it, it's, it's, this is the setup they've chosen. What you want to do it, on the stationary breakout is you're not going to probably turn the puck over in the offensive zone, but you want to take away the passing options in the neutral zone and look to turn the puck over there. And at the very least, you want to force your opponent to dump the puck in and not allow them to gain control of, of the blue line with possession. And that's, as you mentioned, that's what happens in this clip. So the, the setup is not the problem. It's the execution. And, and that's always, that's always the case from a coaching perspective. Lots of teams have solid setup, but how do they execute? That's the key. So they've got structure, but it's how you execute within the structure. And in this situation, and I've seen it in, in, in numerous games that I've watched, basically when a team gets into the state or it, their control breakout where they're set up behind the net, they go 200 feet and end up with possession in the other end. And one of the things that you want to do, if, if you're not going to be an aggressive forechecking team, then you're going to look to turn pucks over on the, for a counterattack. And this is an opportunity where, where you're looking to turn pucks over for the counterattack, but it doesn't happen because Gratz just goes through the minefield, uh, through the neutral zone, gains his own, as you mentioned, with possession, shouldn't happen. So it's a matter of good setup, poor execution. Just to, to to try to wrap it into into simpler words and, and ideas, is it is it fair to, to narrow it down to each and every time your opponent gets a controlled offensive zone entry with speed, you failed your job? In this situation, yes. Definitely. And I would suggest playing the perfect game, which never happens, of course, but playing the perfect game, I would say that's 100% correct in, in any situation. Because even if you're forechecking aggressively, you're always going to have somebody coming back to help your defense to make sure that it's not an odd man rush. So if you're playing a perfect game, you don't give up any odd man rushes and you're holding the blue line, looking to turn pucks over. Now that doesn't happen in the game, but in a perfect game, that's what you would, you would, uh, you would never allow them to gain the zone with possession. Moving forward to clip number three that you simply labeled no traffic. So people who can't see this, who only listen to the podcast, I'd strongly advise them to have a look at, at the clip. Go to post24.at slash ice because it's one of the one of the bigger, bigger problems that seems to to bug the, the Black Wings in the offensive zone. Well, it's it's a bit of an exaggeration. Um The, the, it, it, the, the, if you're going to score goals, you need pucks and people to the net. You're not going to score goals if you don't have traffic in front. And this clip is just, a, it's really an exaggeration. You've got five Gratz people inside and there's nobody at the net. All the Lynch players are on the outside away from the puck. And uh, you're not going to generate any offense doing that. So it's basically... Uh, overemphasizing the fact that there's no traffic in front. And I, I would suggest that 30% of the time, maybe they've got people in front and the other 70% of the time they don't. So you're not, you're not going to score goals unless you have people in front. That's that's to sum it up. That's basically it. Who goes or who has to go in, in, in front of the net? Is there, is there one where you try to, to uniquely identify him and make him, make him go in, into or to the front of the net more often than, than, than others? No, the, the game doesn't allow that because you're, it's a free-flowing game. So when you're in the offensive zone, you're looking to main, maintain possession. So people are always moving around to get into, into passing lanes. And when the puck goes out to the point, it could be anybody that's closest to the net. And whoever's closest to the net has got to try and get in front and create some some havoc for the goaltender. The other thing that it does when you have people in front of the net, the defending team has to defend that. So it opens things up on the outside to maintain puck possession if you can't get a shot to the net because they're focused on on protecting the front of the net, and making sure that that um, there's people you know that they're strong in that defensive position because you don't you don't want to have people alone in front. Now, 
Yeah. We've got to move on to 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 the fourth clip. Obviously, Linz having problems to to get people in in front of the net, and and then on the other hand, which uh, clip number four depicts, they're they're playing around the the goal for for an awfully long long time, and, and Graz didn't didn't really let him enter or make plays in a slot or, or or the high slot. Is that the the basic idea behind clip number four? Well, the basic idea is a couple of different things. Graz Graz outnumbers. Lintz at the puck. So the, the guy coming up, up the boards is under pressure and the Lintz players as passing options are too far away. So the player is under pressure and he has no options to make plays to get puck possession. And Gratz has, has numbers. One thing that I've really noticed with, with Lintz is the opponent almost always outnumbers them at the puck. So, It's two on one or three on one in this instance. There's sort of three grass players right there. And the other part of this clip is is the Lynch player gets kind of out muscled. The grass player just strips him of the puck and um, moves the puck out of the zone. So it's a combination of, of being too far away a puck, away from the puck, so you, you can't maintain puck possession, being outnumbered at the puck. So it makes it really difficult uh, to get possession. Um And and then just getting uh, physically beaten and uh, and allowing the puck to be taken out of the zone. No pinch by the defenseman, so there's no help moving up the board. So they just chip the puck out and they're and they're out of the zone. And and that's one of the things that you know I think was all of these clips are tendencies. You know I could find a number of clips you know where the where everything went well, but the majority of the time these are the things that happen. And so I focused on them from a majority perspective. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's what happens most often. That uh, And that's why, you know, kind of focused on it. Too often on the forecheck, and we got a couple more clips coming up here that show it. Uh, Lintz's second man doesn't help at all. So Gratz makes an easy play and they're out. Or they get pushed off pucks. And, you know, you're, and that, uh, you know, that doesn't bode well for, for creating offensive opportunities because the opponent is out of the zone too quickly. This specific example, how could the the, the player who, who gets gets the pressure on the boards dealt with the situation differently? Is it on the player or is it on on his fellow players who who needed who needed to to help in this situation? Well, for the most part it's on his fellow players that have have to help him by either getting into the battle with them or being close enough where he, he can make just an easy pass to maintain possession. The one lens forward's kind of coming in there um, where he might be an option, but he's not quite there or the forward on the, on the, uh, on the boards can maybe get that puck to the point right away. Um, instead of trying to carry it up the boards where he runs into kind of a trap by Gratz. So those are the type of things that would, would uh, maintain puck possession Uh, if you get it out to the point, you're probably going to get the puck dumped in again and you'll be able to reestablish a forecheck, which is unfortunately is another thing that Lynch doesn't do particularly well. And that's, uh, you know, we talked about the, the things you need to do um, to score goals. And after your initial forecheck is gone, you need to reattack, um, you know, if you want to get yourself enough chances. And, and, and regardless of your skill level, like if, 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 if the skill level isn't enough, you're not going to score more goals, but if you're aggressive, you're going to get more chances. So from a coaching perspective, you want to put in a system of play offensively that generates chances. And by being aggressive, turning pucks over, if you have poor players or not skilled enough players, you're not going to score any more goals, but you're going to get more chances. If you've got a skilled team and you turn those pucks over and you create more chances, obviously you're going to score more goals. Now we're talking with in the second clip about the, the stationary forecheck as as a concept of play. The clips five and six you labeled as soft forecheck. Now that's a problem. Yeah, it, it's a situation where where it, it's an aggressive forecheck where one guy's going real aggressive and he's looking to get into a battle or turn a puck over, and Gratz just makes one pass and they're out of the zone, and so. And, and even when there's a, a, a the first player creates sort of a half a battle 
The second player isn't there to help. And when you create those battles, you need help because the other team, and again, it's a situation where Gratz outnumbers them at the puck. And if you're aggressive on the forecheck, that usually doesn't happen. And if you're aggressive on the forecheck, you've got people pinching down to take the soft, soft easy pass to the boards away. And you're looking to turn you're looking to turn pucks over if you're aggressive in a couple of different areas. You're looking to turn it over low first. And then secondly, if the first pass is made, you're looking to turn it over there. If they beat those two passes, then you're backing off and looking to defend. And and Lintz does a couple of different things. They have the stationary um, forecheck, which we talked about. And they also, um, they basically send what I would call one and a half guys, um, which means their first guy is going hard. Their second guy is, is kind of looking to see what happens. And he's not being overly, overly aggressive until the first pass is made. And by then it's usually too late because good teams are going to make uh, a pass. And if you're not pinching anybody and taking the boards away, they'll go, for example, they'll go D to D up the wall and they're out. Because the third forward and the defenseman are not being aggressive. They're thinking defense. And again, that's okay if you're looking to turn the puck over in the neutral zone. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen that often with Lintz or the games that I've seen. I want to direct people's uh, and, and the listeners' attention to, to clip number six. Obviously, Will Pelletier, uh, center man, tries to, to get the puck and immediately gets pressure from, from, from two Graz players. What could he have done better and what would, in an ideal world, uh, Valentin Lila, Lila number, number 18 have done better? Well, a situation where he's got to be, he's got to help. He's got to help. And, and th th again, they're, they're too far away from the puck, too far away from the puck when the battle is there and uh, Gratz just moves it past them and, and they're out of the zone. And they've, they, they sort of pinched their third forward here, um, but he, the play skates by him. So now they're on a rush. Uh, he gets back into the play to, to negate the odd man rush, but they're still out of the zone and it's just it's just too easy too easy getting out of the zone um and 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 not not looking to turn pucks over inside the zone and not turning them over in the neutral zone and so obviously if you don't turn them over there where are you playing you're playing in your own zone and that's um that's that's not something that i think you want to do just to give people people an idea about a good forechecker who was maybe on, on your team or on opposing teams for checkers where you said he's really good at his job. Oh God, we, you know, and, it, and it's, it's asking the tough questions here. Uh, Danny Ehrman was a really good four checker when we had him in Linz. Brian Levler is a very good four checker because he's big and strong and aggressive. Uh, he's not the fastest guy in the world, but, um, You know he's he's moving on the puck, and when he gets there, he's physical. So what what the what the first four checker wants to do is get the the defenseman. He, he wants to do two things. He either wants to create a battle, in, in which case you can uh, get somebody else there to help, and you you know you may turn the puck over. So he wants to get in the battle, but he wants to make sure that defenseman moves the puck before he wants to. And he wants to try, if he can, to steer the pass to where the second forward, if you're being aggressive, can put pressure on that next pass. So you're you're anticipating where pucks are going to go and you have people moving there in advance and you're getting there quickly. And then that pressure causes the defensive team to turn pucks over or you turn pucks over by being aggressive. So the first four checker wants to create a battle on entry and, and prevent that first prevent the defenseman from carrying the puck past him. He wants him to make sure he makes a pass. Obviously, just a couple of things that, that are not or less than ideal in, in Linz. If you were to, to compile a, a, a wish list or, or a shopping list as regards, let's say, the top two or three priorities in terms of personnel, how would that look like? Oh. Oh, I mean, that's... There's, to me, there's 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 two things, and however you address these two things, I think they're of equal uh, equal importance. I think you have to you would have to improve the skill level um, on defense and and the hockey IQ on defense, and then you would want to have 
more skilled forwards in order to take the pressure off of more balanced scoring within the lineup. So it goes back to what we talked about earlier. Who'd be your first pick? Right-handed power play, puck moving, intelligent defenseman, a la Curtis Murphy for the fans that don't know who Curtis was. He was a, uh, I mean, he was one of the huge factors. We won the champ- the championship my first year. I was in Lens. He was unbelievable, unbelievable player. Um, and, you know, he was, in my opinion, he was the best player in the league that year. Um, and, and, you know, he was a huge factor and he filled that role. And, and plus he was, you know, he had the intangibles as well. He was a quiet leader, um, all of these things. So that would be my, my number one, because I think that uh, you always try, if you can, to, to build from the back end out. Uh, if you have skilled defensemen, you're not going to spend much, as much time in your end. And, uh, you know, then by osmosis, you're going to spend more time in their end and you're going to generate more more opportunities because you're you're playing the game in the opponent's zone. So that would be my number one. Now, Dorian is what I would consider at this point a poor man's. He doesn't fill that role. Uh, he does it in a secondary way. If, uh, but his, his production unfortunately doesn't doesn't lend uh, you know doesn't lend credence to that that comment as things are now. And again, these aren't personal attacks on the players because, like, I, I know them personally and I, 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 I like them. It's just the reality of, of where their game is uh, um, right now. And if I saw Mark, I'd, I'd tell him, uh, you know, we'd sit down and uh, chat and have, you know, share good memories. But if he asked me about how he was playing, you know, I'd have to be, you know, have to be honest. It's kind of where you are right now. Can he get out of it? I guess we'll see. And that's what, what people on this podcast appreciate as well, your honesty. 55 minutes of, of pure hockey education have concluded. Obviously, uh, or hopefully, people have learned a thing or two about the, the, the Black Wings and their ailments. We're going to bring you back in, in a month's time and we're going to put to Paul uh, what, what team uh, to break down next. Is there one team of the, the, the nine we haven't broken down yet that really entices you? Well, the first thing before I, I get to that is when I start blabbering here, which I tend to do when I when I talk about hockey, I get so passionate about what I'm talking about. I hope I don't make it sound too complicated because you know what, Martin? It's not. It's not complicated. Even though I'm talking about all these things that are going on and this, that, and the other thing, it's not that complicated. And when you... Uh, when you get with your team, it may sound like a lot of information and, you know, for the players and all these other things, but it's not. It's really actually quite simple. And I try and so I apologize if I if I over analyze things. But, uh, you know, I'm just trying to 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 do my best to, to, to explain to the people why things happen as they do. And it, it may sound complicated. But it's, uh, you know, it's definitely not complicated for the players. So when I talk about, you know, all these things going on, people are thinking, oh, God, how can anybody comp- compute all these things at once? Well, it's not that difficult when, you know, when you're playing and you're practicing and all these other things. It's it's not something that any team can't do. So to answer your question, is there any team that entices me more than the other? Not particularly. Uh, every team has their their whatevers. Um, that are interesting and they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses. Um, you know, we've, we, the last two podcasts we've done, we were talking about the, uh, the power play in, in, in Klagenford, which hadn't been overly effective. And so that was kind of a, a negative view. Uh, and of course, obviously this one today, when you're dealing with the last place team that um, is kind of uh, struggling in all parts of their game, it's difficult to, to find positive things to talk about in all circumstances as well. Maybe just maybe this has already changed the next time when we reconvene on Hockey O'Clock with Martin Fana. As always, thanks so much for, for educating us. Looking forward to talking to you soon. My pleasure, Martin. Unsere Liga, dein Spiel. Der neue Ligasponsor der Ice Hockey League, Better Home, hat ein tolles Angebot für alle echten Hockeyfans. 
Spiel mit und hol dir jetzt einen Ice Hockey League Quoten Boost auf Bet at Home. Zusätzlich verlost Bet at Home einmal zwei Tickets für ein Ice Hockey League Spiel deiner Wahl am nächsten Spieltag. Geh einfach auf die Bet at Home Facebook Seite und schick uns eine Nachricht mit deiner Lieblingsmannschaft. Bet at Home. Das Leben ist ein Spiel. Rechtlicher Hinweis, Teilnahme ab 18 Jahren. Glücksspiel kann süchtig machen. Hilfe unter spielerschutz.eu Part 3 of Hockey O'Clock again features the legend that is Greg Holst sitting opposite of me. Greg, first of all, thanks for taking the time. Oh, thanks, Martin. You know, we're in your hotel room. It's just a completely different look from last week in the car. Or the week before that in the car. Or the week before that in the car. <laughs> so a couple of times in a, in a row we're doing this. This time around, I thought we might be doing this in, in German, but there are actually reasons why we're keeping it in English. Obviously, uh, because we're tiptoeing around dicey topics. And that also includes the conversation that we're just coming off of. It's Rob Daum, who at the time of the conversation wasn't a member of the FILA organization, which is why we broke down everything that, that ails the, the, the Black Wings. Obviously, things went very fast. And for all the people who didn't see the Pulse 24 match day, Sunday's game between FILA and the Steinbach Black Wings 1992, let's get them up to speed. Rob Daum on Saturday signed a contract with FILA Dan Seaman got his papers. How did you get hold of the news? I was at the rink yesterday at 11.45. And just to, to, to let people know, we're recording this on Sunday evening. Okay, it's Sunday evening right now. We're coming off the game tonight. So yesterday I had practice with the defensemen with another coach of the FILAC The kids, right? The uh, 16, 17, 18 year olds. So I got to the rink early and feel like practiced before us, the pro team. So I had a little bit of time because one of the glasses break. So we're going to be a little late going on the ice. I said, well, I'm going to try to have a talk with Dan Seaman. I'm going to go downstairs. Maybe Payball's here. I'll take the talk to Dan. Just about, you know, the big win they had the night before, a couple nights before on the road, which is in Czechoslovakia, which is a tough place to win. And they're rolling. I mean, they're getting, they're doing really good now. Rollies picked it up. So I went downstairs and I saw Dan walking in the hall. I had my mask on. He didn't quite recognize me. I took it off. He said, hey, Greg. I said, hey, Dan, how you doing? Do you have a couple words for me? Just because I'm doing the Pulse 24 game tomorrow night here. And I'd like to just get, you know, your feet on the team. He said, yeah, come on in. So Pavo was there. Mark Wright was there. We just talked about how they picked up And he told me about, you know, the goaltending, the defense as a team, how it's picked up, a couple of power play goals, a lot of positive stuff. So he was pretty excited about the conversation. I said, well, you must be sleeping better because, you know, once you get a couple of wins, it's tough. He said, yeah, it's pretty good. And I know he enjoys living in feel like, you know, regardless of the bad weather right now. So that was good. Thanks, guys. See you later. And I went on the ice with the kids for an hour and I went back home. And then I went over to see a buddy of mine, uh, the golf pro from Finkenstein. He's an Englishman, and he was heading back to England for a couple months to see his son. So I went over and had a beer with him around four o'clock. And then I got a text with the article that Daum is, Rob Daum is new coach to feel like. And I sent back, I said, is this a joke? And he came back, no, it's serious. And we were all kind of surprised, a couple of guys that contacted me and that I contacted because just because of the optics, the team started bad. They had goaltending troubles. The team wasn't playing defensive well. They were kind of a mess. And his name was floating around. And as we spoke on a podcast where his, his coaching seat was on fire. Then they won a couple of games and they turned it up and off they went. So we were kind of shocked and I was surprised. A little sentimental on it because he's got a young child and his wife's from England and he's really happy here. Been successful as a coach, whatever, you know. 
He won championships. Yeah, but and they had they were having a good run. So optically, it didn't look good because the coach is turning it around. The team's turn. We don't know what's going on in the interior, but the people say, hey, the guy's winning. Great. Why well, would you fire him now? Why didn't you fire him before when he was losing? Was it financial? What was it? So they had their reasons. They had their reasons. And they really wanted Rob down back. Then again, they could have had him in uh, during during summer. That was something that he that he told Hockey O'Clock exclusively first during summertime that he just wanted to have a little more security and that he got back from management. We can hire you for two years because then we can fire you after one if things go downhill. Did you ever have and and I'm an outsider looking in and um, asking maybe the stupid questions, but did you ever have such weird and strange clauses in your contract? If somebody, I always signed one-year contracts when I coached. I always signed, when I started in FELAC, the contract wasn't used because they were in financial trouble. But I set up a bonus system for myself, including fans. And I said, and I did this as a player. That's another whole story there, that one. Gonna have that on hockey. Well, that's a, that, that's a that, at future points. That's a big story. That's an interesting story. So I said, "Well, look, how many fans did you guys have last year? Okay, average was seventeen hundred. Okay, well, let's get that back to where you were. Okay, and I'll help you out. I'll take the fix them, which is okay, but it's not great. So anything up and above that, you know, I should get a little bonus for as we move up the ladder. So if you got and if we make the playoffs or finish in this position." If you're successful, I should be successful to make a little more money. So we we started bad, almost got fired. Then we made the freaking finals, and it worked out good. So back to his situation. I told them, next year I signed one year again. And I did my own contracts. And as a player, I did a lot. Because I always had these little niches in my mind how to do things, right? No agent. Agent as a player, then I started doing my own contracts because agents, I got more than the agents would get me from how I thought things out. I always did a one-year contract because here's what I told feel like. They gave me the opportunity and I said, if I'm not good enough, I'm not going to come back anyway. So give me a one-year contract. And then they got rid of me after the second year, right? When we made the finals again, lost to Clankford in that great series. If somebody said to me, we can't give you a two-year contract because how can we fire you after a year? I wouldn't sign the contract. I wouldn't sign it. That means you don't believe in me anyway, so I'll sign a one-year or I don't even talk to me. That's just my opinion. So then when I did come back, you know what's funny? I signed one-year contracts for six years. So two years, half a year came back. If we make the playoffs, guys, I get a contract. We had that organized. We made the playoffs in the last second. So it's funny because when I went back in 2015 to work with the kids, ended up taking over. We did really good. We almost made the finals. That was an exciting time, it feel like. I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to sign a three-year. First time in my life. Two with the first team and then one with the kids. Go back to the kids for my third year. I had an instinct. I don't know what it was. So I came back and I don't know if it was in the back of my mind. Well, if they fire me, they got to pay me. So that's the only time I ever signed a two-year contract. So they wanted... Rob Dunn was a very good coach, right? He's one of those tactical guys. He studies the game. You're not the winningest coach in, in league history without doing things right. Right, so... He, how many wins does he have? More than you. Has he? I'm Winning as coach. I'm going to have to get back in the game. I'm going to see him. I said, no, no, I'm going to get back in this game. Come on. <laughs> Come on. You're an expert so, on Pulse 24. So I know he's a, he's a really good coach and he has his ways and obviously been successful. Feel like was doing very well. I was not here in the country 
but I did follow it, and then I heard they were on their way to, you know, making the playoffs and doing well, and COVID hit. So they couldn't give him a two-year contract. He was their first choice. So Dan Seaman became basically second choice. So you have to hear both sides how the conversation went on those contract negotiations. And it's not fair for me to say that would have to be talked to the feel like four stand exactly what happened. But when they saw him not going back to Hungary to work with the academy because of COVID, he was in Canada. He had a stomach virus. That's that's something you... you... Oh, he had a stomach virus? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he wasn't well, right? Okay. And he went home and he stayed home. So he wasn't going to go back to Hungary. Okay, so now he's free. Well, I'm sure I feel like God wind of that. And if you heard Rock and Vault talk tonight, there was some issues in the dressing room with groups or whatever. Okay, so, but optically, it didn't look good from the outside when I first looked at it, or people look at it. Well, the coach has finally turned around. Hey, they're winning games. And he gets fired. It doesn't make sense. But then you have to hear the other side of the story. But we talked about this, Martin. And I'm not afraid to say this. When management, and I lived through this, goes to players and asks questions. In my case, this whole seat too tough. Players used to go to him. Our practice is too tough. He's too hard. He's this. When that starts happening... And management goes to players and asking questions. The coach's days are numbered. He's, you're not going to survive. I want to back this up a little bit. Let's assume there is a global pandemic. Oh, there's a global pandemic. If you're going into contract negotiations, would you ask for more security than just a one-year contract as Rob Daum did? Initially? Well, if there's the the season ended, right? With, because of COVID. Was the season going to even start? That's a question, right? So I, I would say from his side, if he wanted a two-year contract, the first year could possibly be in jeopardy. Or And then potentially be year. voided. It could be voided. The contract would probably not be a good contract. So I think, I'm not sure how that is by law. So I think him asking for the second year was insurance for him to have a little security. Management saw it one way. He saw it another way. But if he was the coach they really wanted, and is a very good coach, what is the risk of signing him for the two years? I'm not sure what their thinking was, so I can't answer for them. But that's that's a point that that people or listeners should digest first. A very A very important point when thinking about this this in its entirety. I just uh, dug up the numbers. If I told you Rob Daum had 244 wins since 2000 2001, uh, where uh, we're able to 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 keep the the, the stats in in its entirety, um, where do you think you are? 244 wins for Rob Daum. Where's Greg Holst in terms of wins? Since, oh, since that kind of 2001-ish? Well, I really had no idea about those stats until Pulse 24 pulled out some stat sheets and I kind of was a little surprised, but then I forgot I was in feel like for over eight years, so I had a bunch of wins, right? You're only having four less wins, but you almost coached 100 games more. So there's that. Four four wins off of Rob Daum. You really want to get back into business? 
please say that you're happy with the place you are right now and, and with your role as an expert. Put it this way. Uh, I'm enjoying, again, it took me a while to get the feel of working with the kids and feel like again, it took me long. Now I'm back in the groove, right? And the kids have a little connection to me. So I'm having fun with it. And if they get, and I do get changed in the penalty box, I don't go downstairs where the coaches are. I wear my mask. I go on the ice. If any kid comes within two meters of me, I put my stick right on his head. Don't come near me. And they, they're getting a kick out of it. I say, guys, hey. So that part, I enjoy. I'm really getting the feel for doing this post 24. I'm getting the feel of it. It feels like it's, I'm getting comfortable with it. And it's, I'm really enjoying it. And me interviewing Mika Rafa tonight, this was a freaking highlight for me. It was actually fun. When Mickey saw my face, Rafa, he laughed, right? I, I thought he was going to laugh through the whole freaking thing. But I actually, you guys gave me the room to ask, you know, basically my own questions. And, you know, I knew a couple I would ask what you wanted to know, which I did throw in. And I got off into the family and some other things. So I enjoyed that. I'm actually really enjoying this with the TV, I can also tell you. And so let me finish, sorry, because I'm getting a little lost here. Do I want to get back in the coaching? My name sniffed around a couple of times, kind of came my way through, not direct, but indirect. Because, you know, those interests for me to coach, maybe the women's national team, that kind of came up a little bit. And I kind of said, I, I didn't continue that conversation, a little miscommunication, but I said, because of me doing this TV, and I think we had talked, once we get to the playoffs, you know, there's, it, we're a lot more busy, and it'd be very hard for me to coach. No, I'm not going to coach. I think, I think I'm going to let uh, Rob Down run with this one. There you go. Because you mentioned that interview, obviously we, we need to, 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 to give credit where credit is due. It, it came up during a conference call and it was raised by but Pulse24 is sports editor-in-chief Bernd Birnbaum. He was the one who said, why don't we let Greg conduct the interview? Because he's the one who got him into the league. He's the one who maybe even prepared him for, for what would be a, a great NHL career. How much of a, of a hand did you really have in, in Michi Raffel becoming what he is today? I just gave young players opportunities. I wasn't afraid to... Now, this is pretty factual. I mean, you can ask anybody who was around our organization. When we were having trouble, we didn't change a lot of imports, hardly ever. I mean, I think Foster was the only one. And we pushed the young guys and gave them opportunities. So did I have a hand? No, when we had some meetings in the room, when he came in, I think I told you the story. Mickey Raffle was 17 and 18, and one time he came in the dressing room or in my room after practice, and he was freaking pissed off, fuming. And he actually, I, I can honestly tell you that, he'll probably tell you the same. He had a couple of tears in his eyes. He was so pissed off because he wasn't scoring in practice with his opportunities. I just listened and I watched and I said, Rafa, that's good. That's good. Because a lot of guys we work with now, even in Canada, they don't score and it's, it's okay. It's not okay. He had the bite. They find their own way. I just gave him an opportunity at a younger age to get him in, get involved, wasn't afraid to play him. I actually probably helped his brother, Thomas Raffle, a lot more after he came back from going over to that experiment in Kelowna Rockets and they sent him around. He came back a mental mess. And it took months to get Thomas Raffle back to where he could do a passing drill. Didn't matter. You could be big and strong. He was mentally lost his confidence. Uh, they threw him around in Canada. It was, he learned the business, but we gave him a lot of opportunity. And then slowly after a few months, he started to come back, the playoffs he started to get better. So we helped him. But Mickey Raffle, as I told you, I called Buffalo twice when he was 18 and 19. And I talked to Kim Gellard and I said, he was scouting for Buffalo. I said, hey, this kid's got something. He's pissed off when he's not scoring. Hey, he's got a little bit of a mean side to him. Deceivingly fast. Deceivingly can score. He's got a lot. 
And you know what? They make their own way. You know, I'm just a coach. I can give them some tips, some pointers. You know, I've since worked with him kind of privately. Back in 2015, 16, lately too, he asked me to go on the ice. And we do like an hour of skill and skating and tough. Back in 2015, I was working with the kids. And he, he does the hour. And he says, oh, I'll hold you one more lap. I said, okay, Rav, not a problem. You don't want to go around. You play for Felak for 50,000 euros or you keep making your 2 million. You want to go another lap? Okay. So we had fun with it, but you push the guys and he wanted to be pushed. Michi Raffel is, is a good key word because he was the one who really tried to raise his voice after tonight's match day. He really, he really stepped up like like a leader should do and obviously he doesn't have to because he's just a one month rental if you, if you really break it down but he really put the hammer down how did you see or how did you experience and dissect what he said after tonight's game it was a little bit of an eye opener even yes. to you who's got a good feel for the organization. Oh, no, 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 no. I have a big feel for this organization. That's why I'm living in this town, too. I mean, just feel like when I coached here for those years, I felt like I was a big part of the city. Like, I felt indebted to the fans. I was like freaking, I was blue, blue of ice through and through. When he said that tonight, you know, that wasn't the, the old camp guys that feel like had it. We were fucking warriors. We were warriors. Those players were tough. All of them. Of course you have your problems. So it hits his third game. So this is not only from tonight. Something, even though their last two games, they beat Clankford in a really pretty good game. And then they won in check as VAR 2-1. Maybe he felt something or saw something in the room that, you know, was in his mind. But you win a couple, you don't say much. He saw something tonight that aggravated him. And for him to talk tonight, he's not coming in to be a star player. He talked about it. He's coming in to help the team. So by him saying that honestly, and players are going to hear about it because they're going to they're gonna find out what he said. They're not going to go up to Rafa and say, what the hell are you doing? They're going to maybe listen to him, and some guys are going to have to raise their level. If you go through their scoring and secondary scoring, who's their top scoring? So he's noticed something that isn't right, and he said it, and he was honest because he's a very he's an honest guy. Did it open some eyes? Yes, it did. He opened my eyes. We were kind of like surprised, but you know what? He said what he feels. He said that he really hopes that Rob Dom, whenever he comes in, really steps onto the toes of a couple of players. That's, that's not to be taken lightly coming from Michi Raffel. No, so what I'm saying is he's been practicing with them now for quite a while. Right? He has. So he's an NHL player where you have a role to play. Like he said tonight, we have a role. We know our roles. We do our roles. I feel like as a lot of players... They're all kind of similar. A lot of them kind of want to be scorers. Well, they're not scoring. So what role are you going to have? So Rob Baum is likely going to come in. He's going to watch it and look at some video. He's going to talk to Payball. He's going to maybe confide in his captain. And some, okay, how we feel. I don't know how he does his work. But the players will all be treated the same. You do your job for your team. And he's great tactician, something I never was. I'm, I'm okay at it, but I'm more of a motivator. He will wake up some players and they better be on their toes because he's coming in. He's the boss. He is the boss. Here's how we're going to do it. It's not, what do you think? What do you think? Boom. Because I remember in Lynch, Brett McLean, great player. I know him very well. Very smart, bomb, and he had ideas, and he talked to some of his players. 
about power play and Rob Dama, his ideas. But Rob Dama, he sticks to what he believes in, has been successful with it. And some of these guys, Martin, I am going to tell you, some of these guys are going to be in for a wake-up call. And maybe by Raffle saying that tonight, if the players that heard this, and they will hear it, and they feel that they may, might be one of the two, three, four guys, maybe, maybe Mickey Raffle did them a favor to get ahead of the freaking game before the coach comes. We're going to follow everything that, that surrounds this development. Obviously, another interesting tidbit that, that was mentioned on, on tonight's Pulse 24 match day was coming from VSV Sportvorstand Gerald Rauchenwald. He said that there's been two, two groups in, in, in the locker room that they didn't, didn't want that. Did you have separated or a separated locker room in your in your career? And what does that do to 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 coaches' authority? Number one, you cannot win. You will not win. I played 19 years pro. Probably had a really great dressing room three or four times. So that's not even a, that's not even a quarter of your career. It's very difficult because you have to remember when players come to Europe. Back used to be two, two imports, four imports, five, ten. There's, it's very egotistical. So what happens is guys want their points. They want to have their points, their stats, so they get another contract. But now this has all changed. I mean, teams have 10, 12 imports. So you can't all be scorers. So we try to tell guys, when I coach with guys, trying to help guys in their careers, you guys have to remember, if you sacrifice some points... To play for the team, and the team is successful. So we had some great runs in Philak, right? Four times in the finals in five years. So do you think agents or some coaches aren't paying attention to what we're doing? And if your stats aren't fantastic, but they're good, and you guys are making the fun, you're doing something for the team. So it can't only be stats, but players think, well, I got 20 goals and I got 40 assists. I'm going to get a great job. Not necessarily true. So if good coaches and good scouting systems or people called me, they would ask me, coaches about a player. He was a great team guy. Yeah, he had some more offensive stuff, but he played for the team too. So players have to understand. Feel like right now, they have a lot of guys frustrated because they're not scoring. They are, they are shocked that the league is as tough as it is because when players come over here, I'm telling we've talked about this. Oh, I'm going to go play in Austria. There's a team from Italy. and uh, so, uh, I played in American League stuff. They get here. They are surprised how freaking tough it is to score in this league. Ask Mickey Raffle. He's played three games. He hasn't scored a couple of good chances. It's just not that simple. And you have some of these guys that had pretty good stats, American League, NHL, a little bit of sniff around the NHL, and they go, whoa, this is tough. So they're going to have to, it's going to have, Rob Dom will change that. Dress. If the dressing room is divided, you have no chance. Was it, Bruce, was it President Roosevelt who said, a house that is divided cannot stand? I think it was Roosevelt. And that is true. It's no different for a dr The team has to be tight. You can't have groups. The Austrians here, two guys there, Canadians. Hey, you got to do your job. You got to stick together and have some fun with the room. The room is the key to being successful. Now, talking about successes, one of the success stories of tonight obviously belongs to the Steinbach Black Wings 1992. I know it's a game of three periods, but if it's a game of two halves, we saw two very different Black Wings teams. Why? I can only give my personal opinion on it from experience. So That's I, what we want. So, you know, I'm just saying how I, I felt with the game. 
feel like is for the first time this year, clearly the favorite to win this game. Lynch has always played well in this rink. And that's from my experience. We always played well in their rink. Always great games. Lynch tonight, Labler said it best in his interview. Well, what happened to you guys tonight? How did you start? I'm sick of playing how we were and sick of losing. So the players showed a lot of pride tonight. Coach said, we're, go we're not going to play on our heels. We're going. Fialak was not ready for that. The first goal, like Raffle said, well, we could have bounced back. Lynch dominated the first period. Where were they having problems? Any scouting report I have? I talked to Philip Lucas the day before. I got stuff today. Their breakouts, they were not making crisp passes. They couldn't break out under pressure. They weren't winning the one-on-one -on -one battles. They weren't playing defense. They weren't really doing much of anything well. Only had three guys scoring. You know, three, four guys. So tonight, for some reason, maybe it was the effect of bringing the new player in. Because this guy with experience, NHL experience, played in Russia, 37 years old. Just, he doesn't have to be, go out there and win the game. He's just got to walk in that dressing room. And his first impression is going to be how they play. So I think his effect added something to the dressing room. I really believe it did. Their breakout passing in the first period was crisp. They walked out of the zone every time. They put pucks to it. They played. That was not the Lynch team that we all know. They were winning. They were trying their hearts out. Second period, they started well, too. Feel like started coming a bit. Lynch still had three, four huge chances, so feel like was not in their defensively sound mindset of the last two games. Because why? Because it was Lynch. It wasn't Salzburg. It wasn't Vienna. It wasn't down in Czechoslovakia, which is a tough place to play, where the goalie obviously played well down there. Typical, typical kind of or, or fashion of underestimating. And Un 100%. You're in, when you play a top team, it's fear factor. Fear is your motivator. Scared to death. Let's keep this simple, guys. Move the puck, bang, see it, make it. Hey, let's be, come on. They didn't have that tonight. They were shocked by Lentz in the first period. And then we talked about it. Can Lentz keep this going for 60 minutes? What their coach talked about, can they keep doing it? Conditionally, is their condition good enough to keep it going? Second period, first 10 minutes, yeah, they were there. I feel like it took over a little bit. In the third period, their breakout passes missed. Why? Is there a reason for it? In my opinion, conditioning. When you're not in great shape, and you get tired and you're getting worn out. It's not mental now, it's, it's conditioning. And the passes aren't quite on. So you're trying hard, but it's just not working. First period there, Chris, boom, boom, boom. Can they keep that intensity going for 60? That slowed down. Tonight's game, the refereeing wasn't bad, but I will tell you, if you go back and watch the video, they missed a couple of hooks and a cross check right in front of the net that feel like should have had called against them. And those three penalties that were called against Lynch, one after the other in the third, a little, little questionable. So feel like had a huge opportunity. So they weren't as crisp on the breakouts. They kind of lost a little bit of that forechecking power because the feel like did get better and they didn't have the energy. But I will give them one thing. They blocked shots. They tried. Their, they killed three penalties. Kickard was solid. His how he stood in the net. He looked big, and he had to be a great penalty killer because the goalie has to be a top penalty killer. They showed more of a team effort tonight than Felix did. And now 
When Raffle says those words, are we really a team, guys? So what he was basically saying, if we're going to be a successful, we got to clean up this room and everybody's got to get it on board for the team, not for personal reasons. At the very least, what we do like to see is that things get tired. Obviously, the Black Wings starting maybe with tonight to make up some some ground on on other teams, teams right before them that that kind of really got the coaching carousel going and starting to turn. Rob Daum is not the first new coach incoming. We had a firing in Bratislava first, and there's an old acquaintance, I might say, with Peter Dreisaitl coming coming in. What did you make of, of his hiring in Bratislava? I think he's had a pretty coach. I don't know that much about his whole coaching career. I know he was a good player. I think I actually played some games against him towards my end of my career. And he was a real good player. His son's not bad. I, I heard about him. He, he might not be too bad. Yeah. He's not bad. Eh? I, I'm sure he's playing some of dad's uh, beers in the summer. But they made a change, I, I don't know, with Coach Chatter, right? I don't know exactly what went down there. I haven't really seen their team live. Or I see their team when I watch their team. I seen them, you know, highlights and I watched a game. They got some freaking good players. Like, they're big. They had some good shooting. There, there's, they got some stuff. Like, I think that's just my, my gut feeling. They're, I think they have some potential. I think Dry Settle coached in, in Czechoslovakia, right? For five, five, six years, is that correct? Well, that's a hell of a good league. So he has a connection to Czechoslovakia, Slovakia. He's in that world. So when is he coming in? Is he coming in right right now? He's not in yet, right? He wasn't in today, was he? Last time I checked was that uh, Dusan Pajek, the, the vice president and GM, was was coaching the, the two games in Dornbirn, but he should be taking over um, any minute or, or any day now. So what will he bring in? He will bring in definitely a trainer effect. Because he coached in the Czech, those players know him. That's no urban myth. That's a real thing. The, well, the, the, the trainer effect. It's a huge, it's a huge thing. Usually when a, usually when a coach gets fired, almost always, not always, but almost always, The players have something to say about it. So what that does is, well, you guys didn't like this coach or that coach, and we made the move. Well, now it's up to you guys to step up your freaking game. That normally goes for two, three games, where it's an effect and boom. And now do the characters and personalities in your team now that all the fear factor is over and the new coach, or I better show, I better better not show them all my colors, but let's show them what I got. And after three, four games, things go back to the way they were unless you have really good characters in the team. So the coaching effect, I think Dreisaitl going to Bratislava, if my gut feeling is, those players know who he is. You coach in the top Czech league for that long, you know what you're doing. So he will try to clean it up. He'll try to figure it all out. And Bratislava is going to be a dangerous team. We're going to be very excited to see how dangerous they can be. I only got two more talking points on, on this, this podcast tonight. Obviously, with two new coaches incoming, that means that two coaches have been let go. How difficult as a coach is being let go? Ron Kennedy, who taught me a lot, told me one time, Greg, if you're a good coach, never be afraid to get fired. But when you you'll always get another job. You'd be sad for a day or two and upset, and you get right back on the horse. But when you did get fired, how did that, that feel? How did that sting? Well, in my, you mean in my situation? Well, you know... I coached a long time in the field. I came back, wasn't supposed to coach, took over again a couple of times. I came back to try to help the ship, help the town. I love the town. I knew it was coming. 
it was just a matter of time. Because I told two of the management, sat up before, I said, guys, this was after I signed that two year. And I sat upstairs with them and they were saying some weird things to me. I said, guys, if you don't want me to freaking coach, just let me know. I got a contract. Well, then don't bring me back, but just tell me to my face. They couldn't. So when I started back in the, so the first year I took over, then another year, and the only, we just ran into injury troubles. We were actually a dangerous team. That's another story. How did it feel? How it went down is not how it should have gone down. People close to me and a lot of fans and people were not upset that I got fired. It was the art and vice. It's how they did it. Like I'm sitting in the freaking room. We lost to Innsbruck in a close game and they, they were a good team. But just, I told Pints, Pintner was assistant with me, right? I said, Pints, this is a month before. I said, Pintner, it's just a matter of time. Believe me. No, no, no. I said, it's a matter of time. Because they had gone to the players. I know this. Now I know this. And is Greg too tough? Is this that? Well, so I knew my days were numbered. That's okay. How it happened. I'm sitting in the dressing room after we lost to Innsbruck with 3-2. They scored an empty net goal. I'm in the room. Dr. Cherpel, good friend of mine, really great guy. He's feel like blue and blue. Played for them. He's given his 20, 30 years as a doctor for this team. He's sitting in there. Pinder's sitting to my right. Karish Balmer sitting there. My buddy Kershi, great goalie coach. He walks in. I don't think I have to say a name. Y'all kind of know who it is. And he walked right in. He says, Cheryl, out place. Kershi, out place. Greg, sorry, got to make the move. You're done. Pints, you're coach. I knew it was coming. I said, Pines, crack me open a big beer, will you? And he cracked me open a beer. Did you have salt? Yes, I did have salt because I have that, hey, big time. So did they do that right? No. I gave, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about a coach who loves the city, loves his players. We were successful. It's not how you do it. It's not, before I left the rink, the Innsbruck team knew, all the Felak players knew that I was fired. It was on the freaking internet before I even got out of the rink. I called Dr. Cherpel. Dr. Cherpel came back in, not very happy. Kershi came back in, not very happy. I said, guys, it's okay, it's okay. By this time, I said, Pints, give me another beer, will you? I called my girlfriend because she walked home after the game and she could feel the buzzing in the stands. She could hear my name being called. I felt bad for her. She's sitting there by herself and people start, you know, Holtz house and like, and that's just part of the business and stuff. So she went home. I called her. I said, I got fired. Dr. Chirp was with me. We're going to go have a bite to eat and a beer. Can you? She was probably in her pajamas by then. I said, can you get dressed? Boom. Of course. So she, myself, Cindy, and the doc, we went up and had a bite to eat. I got to the restaurant. This was a restaurant where I had only been once before. But I remember walking in, and the doc was great to come with me. Not to come from me, just to come. And, and Cindy was with me. And you know what? There was people in there that had been at the game. I could feel it. I could feel in the air that it didn't seem right. I could actually feel it. It didn't seem right to them either. And, and, and that's okay. I'm not, I'm not complaining. It's the way it is. But here's, and I said, here's what you do. You call me in the next day. You say, Greg, we've got to make a change, right or wrong. You've done a lot for the organization. It's time to make a move. I said, guys, I understand. Let me go talk to the players, my players. We'll talk about it. I can wish them luck. Guys, give it a shot. Make it a move. 
boom. Let me handle it with a bit of class. I didn't see the players. I saw them a couple of guys at the gym, and they didn't know what to say to me. But it's not the firing. It's how you do things in life, right? It's about respect. So a couple of days later, I asked this gentleman, well, why, why, why did you come in like that and just fire me? You were actually my personal coach for some problems I was having in my life. You come in, you take over the organization, you come down, you fire me. Why, why wouldn't you just call me in next day? He said, well, two of those guys upstairs, I'm not saying the names, they sent me down and said, you get rid of that guy. Well, is that how, is that how it's supposed to work? What did I learn from it? I learned about people. I learned something about myself. Was I disappointed? No. I knew it was coming. Because I told Pints, I said, Pints, if we would have won tonight, it was a close game. They're a good team. We're not better than them. If we would have won the game, it would be the next game. If we won four in a row, it would be the next game. Because they wanted me out. It's the way it was. They had their nose in with the players. They called the players. Greg's too tough. He's too this. He's too whatever it was. So I remember next day, okay, or the next day or day after, I came in to get my stuff. And Pines is going to take over. I said, Pines, you got to give it a shot just to get the feel of what this is all about. And he wasn't sure if he should. But I said, hey, it's going to come. I told him a month before, and it came. So I put up on the board just one, wishing him luck. I remember when I wrote on the board. And I said, Pines, you believe in your, I can't remember exactly, but it was like, I wish you lots of luck, you guys. Pines, you have to go with your gut and coach how you feel. You got to go with your gut, how you want to coach. And he, Pines learned a lot, obviously. He ran with his ideas, and it was not easy. And I remember a couple of weeks later, he called me and said, Hose, you want to go for lunch? We went for lunch. And he said, wow, what a difference. If you're assistant or your head coach. I said, how are you sleeping? He goes, not very good. I said, welcome to the world of coaching. So it's a tough business. That firing was more disappointing for me for my connection with the city and the fans and the success we had because my heart was for this team and city. I can also tell you that. And where am I living now? Back in the city. So as Mike Stewart said, it's a rugged business and if it's fair or not, life is not fair. So you have to be able to, as a coach, accept what comes. And if you're good and you believe in yourself and you have something to you that you got some sandpaper in there and you, and you got something, you will get another coaching job. And that's what Ron Kennedy always told me. He was fired two, three times. He said, Greg, if you're good and you got something, you will always get another job. Look at the NHL carousel. They go from team to team. Because they're all good. They just need a new voice in a new room. We'll conclude this insights or these insights about, about coaching life and, and everything that, 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 that comes with it. But we're gonna, gonna, gonna talk about it again at a future point on Hockey O'Clock. One last thing I want to mention or I want to talk about on, on, on this episode with you is the upcoming Pulse 24 match day. It's going to be an interesting affair of two teams who have been so good for such a long time. Salzburg against Vienna. Two big guys going at it. What are you looking for at this game? Salzburg-Vienna? It will be a little bit of a statement game. For whom? For Salzburg. Interesting. Because they've had their ups and downs this year. They picked up a couple... Extra players now, you know, very good players. I don't know the new guy, but he's coming David in. McIntyre was just signed. Okay, yeah. 
Vienna made a statement last night, speaking of statements, when they beat Bolzano. So they're, they're kind of back on track with their rugged play and they're tough. And they, that was a statement game. Salzburg's last game in Vienna last month or a month ago when we was dominated by Vienna. So this is a statement game because Salzburg has it running a little bit now. So it's a big, big game for Salzburg. Obviously for Vienna because they're going to be a tough team to beat. It's a statement game for Salzburg to see where they are. Very much looking forward to it. Very much looking forward to your next appearance on Hockey O'Clock and also on the Pulse 24 match day, which is going to be Vienna against Bolzano. So the, the Viennese, Viennese weeks, quote unquote, are going to com continue. Anyhow, every time a pleasure having you on. Thanks for all your insights. Martin, it's been a pleasure tonight. Thanks, buddy. Das war Hockey O'Clock. Das war auch Episode 20. Natürlich gibt es auch eine 21. Episode und die schon nächste Woche. Und da gibt es dann den zweiten Teil des großen Karriere-Rückblicks mit Patrick Harand. Und nicht nur das, es analysiert natürlich auch den Puls24-Experte. Dort dann Daniel Welser. Davon. Hockey O'Clock mit Martin Pfander wurde präsentiert von Bet at Home, dem offiziellen Ligasponsor der Ice Hockey League. Hol dir jetzt deinen Ice Hockey Quotenboost auf Bet at Home. Unsere Liga, dein Spiel.